Evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the council meeting of Ju June 15th, 2021. Um, we are about to begin, um, and I will be asking our town clerk to do roll call. Before doing so, I do want to acknowledge that council member Rista will not be in attendance tonight. Um, all council members take attendance at meetings very seriously, but um, Ms. Risto and her family are working through a family tragedy. And we just want her to know that all of us, her colleagues, as well as the town um, has her family in our thoughts and our prayers. So, so with that, Ms. Neese, if you could do official roll call. Thank you. Council member Hudis. Here. Council member Badami. Here. Vice mayor Rennie. Here. Mayor and chair Syok. Here. Uh, so we do have a quorum and our meeting is officially beginning at 7.02 p.m. Uh, before we met, we had a closed session and Mr. Schultz, if you could provide the report on our closed session. Yes, good evening. Prior to regular session, council met in closed session to discuss real property negotiations. No action was taken that requires reporting under the Brown Act. Thank you. And at this time, I will be asking my colleagues to share items of concern or interest that they have participated on on behalf of the Town of Los Gatos on the various committees that they are serving on. And so I will begin with Mr. Rennie, Vice Mayor Rennie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the first thing I would note is I received um, several public comments in support of our DEI efforts. So I want to would like to thank everyone that sent in their support for that. Um, on 6-2, um, I attended the Bay Area Air Quality Management um, special board meeting. Um, the only item on that agenda was the rule 6.5, which is related to the particulate matter limits from the refineries um, catalytic cracking units and whether we should go with a 0.02 limit or a 0.01 limit. Um, the board asked questions for about an hour on that day, and then we took public comment for six hours um, and run out of, ran out of time and, and continued the meeting. On 6-9, uh, I attended the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Authority Board. Um, one item to note was that we approved a resolution to su support the Beyond Gasoline Initiative led by the Joint uh, Venture Silicon Valley, um, the initiative's goal of cutting gasoline consumption in Silicon Valley by 50% by 2030 are, are align, well aligned with Silicon Valley Clean Energy's mission and efforts to support electric vehicle adoption. Um, on 6-3, I chaired the Silicon Valley Clean Energy's um, legislative committee. On 6-3, I also attended um, VTA um, did a presentation on their bike super highway plans through the county. And on 6-7, um, I also attended the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Authority Risk Oversight Committee. Um, going back to 6-3, I also attended um, the VTA board meeting as an alternate observer. And on 6-8, I attended our uh, Community Health and Senior Services Commission um, where we finally wrapped up um, all the recommendations for that you'll see in tonight's agenda item on that subject. And on 614, um, I attended the Town Finance Committee with Councilmember Hudis. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Hudis. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Pretty light assignment this last period. Um, let's see. Um, uh, June 9, I uh, participated in the Conceptual Development Advisory Committee. Um, and then on, uh, and then the Finance Commission on uh, the 14th. Thank you, and Council Member Badami. Thank you. On June 2nd, I attended a meeting with our town manager, Laurel Prevetti and Chief of Police, Peter Decina. On June 9th, I attended a meeting at the Conceptual Development Advisory Committee along with Councilmember Hudis. On June 11th, I toured the town offices and facilities with our town manager, Laurel Prevetti. On June 14th, I attended a meeting of the Finance Commission as an observer. June 15th, this afternoon, I met with the Executive Director of KCAT along with two KCAT board members. 
And I've also corresponded with members of the community regarding agenda items and general concerns regarding town issues. Thank you. And, and items that I'd like to report on um, of concern, uh, Cities Association of Santa Clara County did have our board meeting on the 10th. Um, at that time, we did invite uh, one of our attendees was Chief No of Sunnyvale, who also happens to be, I believe, um, and I'm going to ask Chief DeSena to correct me if his, the title is incorrect, but he's president of the Chiefs Association of Santa Clara County this year, um, and they presented um, some areas where they felt that they could collaborate. They, the police chiefs with city managers and city councils. Um, there is a report that they are pulling together. One of them is upcoming training. What I'd like to do is agendize that with the town manager so that the council can weigh in on these suggestions that are being provided by the entire um, County Chiefs Association and we'll have an opportunity to have that conversation and ask Chief DeSena to also weigh in. Um, and in addition to that, as um, others have indicated, just correspondence with the town on a variety of subjects. So, and Ms. Prevetti, your manager report. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, the library is now open on both floors. So come visit us, uh, bring your mask, please. On July 19th, we hope to invite uh, our patrons to also enjoy seating within the building. So right now, um, please enjoy your materials outside of the building, but we are open on both floors. In addition, our summer reading program is underway. It's called Reading Colors Your World. You can log into the town's uh, library website and log in your reading materials and uh, get prizes, et cetera. And this is for all ages. In addition, uh, next Monday, the 21st, will be our last COVID pop-up testing site here in Los Gatos at the Adult Recreation Center. Reservations are recommended and appointments are now available. And that concludes our report. Thank you. Thank you. We now are going to move into our consent item. And uh, before I open that, I do want to highlight two areas. One is that under consent, under our new rules, any member of the public will have an opportunity to comment on any item on consent without necessarily pulling it. I also wanted to point out that we do have several items, 18 items on our consent agenda. These are normally placed on there, items of what is considered routine and administrative. There are a lot of contracts on there. That is because in July, there are no council public hearings. And so staff is trying to front load as much of uh, is necessary so that July will be a productive time for them as council takes their break. And so with that, uh, first I will look to our public to see if there are any members of the public that would like to comment on items one through 18 under consent. So, and I see several hands raised and so I'll call each one over one at a time. First one is Kevin Arroyo. Thank you, Town Council. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Kevin Arroyo and I'd like to speak uh, about item 13 regarding the rainbow stripes at the town crosswalks. First off, I'd just like to say, I think it's a great idea and fully support it. One of the great characteristics of this town is that it's welcoming to all groups in society, especially ones that have historically been discriminated against, including the LGBTQ community. So once again, thank you, Town Council, and I look forward to seeing more of these positive actions to improve our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arroyo. And um, um, let's see, unfortunately, I can't see the participant list now. And so, Ms. Nice, if you can call. Oh, okay. Next speaker is C. Roy. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Town Council. I really, really appreciate this opportunity for public comment at the beginning. Uh, I am commenting on items number three and 13 on your agenda today. Please reject items three and 13 for several good reasons. First, both proposals bring division and strife into our community, the exact opposite effect of the pretense for which the Council is proposing these items. Secondly, the Council has inf insufficient authority to implement said proposed ordinances in violation of state and county laws per your own discussion on said items. 
as well as the U.S. Constitution. Thirdly, and finally, the risk to the town of Los Gatos for the proposed ordinances exceeds any benefits and risks of the valuable budget for any lawsuit issues. Specifically, item three is a proposal for the ordinance of many of the Los Gatos town code to institute general neutral pronouns. And item 13 is to add rainbow stripes to two crosswalks. Uh, regarding the crosswalk stripes, per your own admission, the design of the cross of the sidewalk stripes is regulated by state and federal traffic control standards. And that is very limiting in colors, yellow and white. That is not intended to promote the white race nor the yellow race, uh, but it is just for clearly optical purposes and a tried and true tradition. You are now directing the staff to deviate from the standard. Again, these are your own words to deviate from the standard and you want to provide quote, liability relief uh, to the engineer and with the associated risk to the town remaining. So by your own admission, again, you're keeping that risk. The uh, intended, the proposed at reduced risk of visual impact is a uh, non-issue as well. Bottom line is the constitution is the supreme law of the land. And I wanna bring the attention of the council with all due respect that you are incurring liability by violating the equal protection clause at the end of section one of the 14th amendment. The clause is the equal protection, it is not promotion. You are using the precious tax dollars to promote one class over another. Furthermore, you're not even doing it equally. You are giving one class superior rights and attention and benefits. The equivalent would be to paint a sidewalk saying straight is superior. You're not doing that. The bottom line, it's not your job to promote one class over another. It's not your job to act as cultural and social engineer master in our culture. Everyone gets along just fine for many years. I have lived with people of different sexual orientations since I was a child. And it seems that with all your good intentions, you're actually creating more strife and risk for the city. Good day. And uh, if I could look at the participant list again. Next speaker is Ms. Javi. Good evening. I just want to make sure that I'm, um, this is an opportunity for me to speak to the public commentary part of the evening. I'm not speaking on a particular um, item. So Ms. Javi, that would be under verbal communications. This time is for items one through 18 under our consent agenda. Okay, I'm sorry. So I'll wait. I'm, I'm sorry about that. No worries. Sir. And again, to those that are um, have their hand raised, this is to speak on items one through 18 on our consent agenda. Next speaker is Amy. Good evening, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the consent items. Um, I fully support the consent item number three for gender um, neutral language and item number 13 uh, for rainbow stripes in the two crosswalks on Main Street by Town Hall. Uh, I believe that this, uh, these items actually promote inclusion. They do not promote uh, strife. Thank you. And our next speaker is, let's see. I suppose. Yan Wu. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm strongly opposing item number 13 and opposing item number three. So number 13 first. So we are equal taxpayers. A certain group of people wants uh, rainbow stripes. How about a Christian group wanting a cross paint painted next to crosswalk? You know, I came from China. So we all know stop Asian hate, right? That's the right thing to do. Then an Asian group wants stop Asian hate sign painted next to the crosswalk. How could you say yes to one group and say no to other groups? That is the very definition of discrimination. To avoid discrimination and keep the traffic signs clear, not confusing and prevent accidents, 
please do not add any stripes or paintings. Road is for safe traffic. It is not an artist's canvas. It is not a piece of scratch paper. So now item number three uh, about the gender neutral pronouns. Replacing gender specific uh, pronouns with gender neutral pronouns in official documents, that is replacing accuracy with ambiguity. We know the grammar of German is very strict, hence very accurate. Not only pronouns, but also articles, adjectives are all gender specific, that's German. English, English language has just enough gender specific pronouns to be clear and to be accurate, just enough. Please do not ruin them, please do not waste them, but use those noun pronouns, gender specific pronouns accurately and respectfully. Furthermore, we are a com community of multiple ethnic groups and languages. When the official original English documents are translated into say Chinese, the Chinese translations and Japanese and so on and so forth, that confusion, if you remove the clear gender specific pronouns, that confusion will, trans will propagate into those translated documents and will cause even more confusion for more people. Thank you. Next speaker is Yvette. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. And uh, just like uh, Yan Wu said uh, before me, I strongly oppose items three and 13. And uh, first of all, addressing number three, uh, let's follow the science. There are only two genders. And I believe this supposed uh, uh, gender, trying to include every gender, is really about breaking up the families, period. And then finally, uh, item number 13, I also agree <laughs> that this is ridiculous to include these rainbow stripes because yes, why not have a Christian flag and why not have flags for everything else? And really um, crosswalks are about safety. It's not, a, it's not some place to put some, uh, push uh, some political point of view. So I strongly oppose both items three and 13 and I believe um, these are just a waste of taxpayers' money, which does not include the viewpoint of all taxpayers. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Maureen Heath. And Maureen, it looks like you uh, have talking permitted. You just need to unmute yourself. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm speaking to support items three and 13, uh, specifically the gender neutral pronouns and the rainbow stripes uh, crosswalk on Main Street. Thank you, Los Gatos, for embracing diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Mayor, for your heartfelt message on the Los Gatos website about diversity and inclusion. June is LGBTQ Pride Month. Nine cities in the county of Santa Clara have recognized Pride Month by either raising the rainbow flag or by lighting a building in rainbow colors. Both the city of San Jose and the city of Cupertino have rainbow crosswalks and have had no adverse consequences. Thank you. Our next speaker is Donnelly. Hi there. Um, so I would also love to voice my support for the painted crosswalks surrounding item 13. As we see many rainbow sidewalks in other towns and cities, they have been painted without any accidents as a result. And I think it would be a wonderful addition to the town's bland asphalt. Um, not only do they show support for the LGBTQ plus community and a great site for many young and old, 
Um, they, I, I, I have, I'm have tons of friends who are within that community. And as someone who considers themselves an ally, I would love to have a, vis a visual representation of the town support for the LGBTQ residents or visitors and as a celebration of life. Why not celebrate the pride people have for loving who they love, especially during Pride Month? If taxpayer money is a huge concern, heck, I'll get down on my hands and knees with paints I bought myself. A rainbow is a beautiful symbol and I support the painted sidewalks fully. Thank you. Next speaker is Lindley Kerr Hogan. Hi there. Um, thank you for letting me speak again this evening. I want to express my disgust at the decisions being made by our elected town council. It is crystal clear that you have no intention of protecting the good residents, families, and churchgoers of Los Gatos. First, in our Los Gatos streets, museum, library, and businesses, you promote and implement an anti-white, anti-Jew ideology with your racist, listen, learn, change, grow, I diversity, equity, inclusion, and Black Lives Matter ideology, curriculum, training, and violent artwork. But as if that wasn't enough, now you are consider considering adding anti-procreation, anti-family, anti-heterosexual, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, godless ideology and artwork into Los Gatos with your support for LGBTQ and BLM, two political organizations aimed at destroying the family unit. This is exactly how the founders of BLM described their agenda. They are self-proclaimed Marxist. Look it up, it's on their website. These are not people who love their families or human life. These are people who aim to turn our girls into boys and boys into girls. They are a threat to human life and they've messed up an awful lot of families. I know this by experience. By adding rainbows to the crosswalks and eliminating gender pronouns, you are promoting exactly what the communists want for our society. A one-stop shop for human beings. No individualism, no creativity, no reason to live. If you believe it is right and fair to promote LGBTQ and BLM, who are political um, organizations at taxpayer expense, you must promote all other groups such as Christianity and families and whites and Jews, as well as many others. In order to counter and balance the town's views, you must promote all other views and this is gonna get expensive. What we know today is that when you take God out of daily life, you end up promoting everything communists love. It looks to me and many others in town that you desire for Los Gatos everything a communist would desire. I would advise you to stop your pro-communist ideologies in Los Gatos or resign for you are still failing to uphold your oath to protect your constituents from enemies domestic, such as BLM and LGBTQ and foreign, such as Chinese Communist Party. You must protect us or resign. Should you not resign, you will continue to be used as the useful idiot you've been all along to the communists. If you look, smell, taste, and sound like a communist, you are one. Don't be a communist. It isn't good for your career, health, or America. And let me tell you this. I love everybody. And if you're gay, I love you just as much as I love a straight person. But don't stick it in my face. And don't try and influence my children because I resent that. Get it out of my family. If we could have Miss Javi. Hi there, is this public commentary? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Javi. No, this is still um, our consent agenda. Oh, sorry. Carla I'll, take, I'll take my hand down and put it back, back up later, thanks. Thank you. Carla Albright? Okay, sorry about that. Um, Thank you for taking my comment. I'm not very well prepared for this, but I do want to speak in favor of uh, consent items three and 13 and want to thank the council for their tireless work to do to better our town and to continue progressing and moving forward and being inclusive um, as a town. So I appreciate that. I think back on when I was a kid, the person who delivered the mail was a male man back then, as in many of the pronouns were 
you know, police man, et cetera. And we weren't considered communists when we shifted to postal carrier or the he, she's, he slash she that went into. So going gender neutral just makes sense so that we're inclusive and it has nothing to do with an ideology. So I thank the town for moving forward on both um, concepts and um, that's all. Next speaker is Joseph. Thank you very much for all you do. The, you, you're busy, busy council members and doing so many things every day of the week. So thank you for that. Um, regarding standards for the, the pronouns, please uphold high standards. If you do, do go genderless, do not use it. We are not dogs and sheep or rocks. And do not use they when referring to a singular a person. If you want to use he or she every time, go ahead. If you want to use he about half a time and she about half a time, that's great too. I hate seeing lower standards. I hate seeing our society devolving into a getting worse and worse and worse. Do not, please do not use the they's for singular. Do not use it's for human beings, whatever you do. Regarding number 13, it does seem I love diversity. I love inclusion. I love festivals and celebrating everything. However, if this is not to code, we need to indemnify individuals for if and when someone gets hit to be sued. This doesn't seem like the proper place to put a pro LGBT message on, even if others have done it. Just because someone else has done it doesn't mean it's right for you. Your mommy probably told you that years ago. Uh, we should not be taking a large financial hit, taking large financial downsides to promoting a particular sexuality uh, orientation. I love celebrations, but the way that, that this town, I believe, and so many others have gotten so focused on not representing the community, the C word in particular, it used to be called Christmas. I'm not Christian, but it's a wonderful holiday. And the way that we've worked so hard to get rid of wonderful parts parts of Americana, wonderful celebrations, to destroy them, to promote only particular things that, that sit, fit a particular social, social ideology. As you may know, that is fascism. There's economic fascism and social fascism. Please avoid the fascism where you get in government and, and institutions to align with each other to promote a particular agenda. That's not the place for things. I like the idea of all the above. So please spend money um, representing everybody and those organizations that uh, represent the, the populace. Strawberry festivals are great. You know, Christmas is great. And LGBT is great as well. They're not a derived, derived group at this day and age. They're celebrated, thank goodness, but let's not waste any more time, effort, and money for only one group and not the others. Please represent everybody. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Karen Rubio. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Um, thank you, Town Council, for all the great work that you do. I'm Karen Rubio, and I would like to support your um, the consent items number three and number 13. Um, I'm listening to a lot of speakers, and everybody has a lot of great points. But what occurs to me is that there's not one group being celebrated above the other. We're just trying to include people who have been traditionally not only left out of society, um, but actually demonized and, and um, killed for, for their, the person they love. Um, I have friends and family who are LGBTQ. I know that this population suffers from greater rates of depression and suicide, um, mostly because of the way they are treated in our society. And I think it's a wonderful gesture um, and a good start to include people like that. Um, you know, everybody's saying that 
we're celebrating one group above the other. No, we're just including people who have been left out. And there's a huge, there's a world of difference in that. So I just want to say thank you very much. And I do support those measures. Next speaker is Quincy. Hello, and I just want to talk about item number 13. Simply put, there's no logical reason to be against this unless you are against accepting others as who they are. If people love everyone, they should not be considered a threat to daily life. And as an ally of the LGBTQ community, it angers me how this is even a question up for debate, especially in Pride Month. It is a rainbow colored crosswalk. And if this creates so much anger that people are willing to come here and complain about it, then that just reflects the people who live in our community. Like other people have previously said, it is not truly about safety and other people just wanna halt and stop this project about accepting other, uh, everyone just then to divide our town even more. I encourage all the other speakers who are against these measures to speak, to think about their actions and how they potentially might hurt others by denying such a fun project created to bring people together. Thank you. Next speaker is Cindy. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I just wanna say that I oppose, obviously oppose three and 13. Um, I feel that both of them are just a slap in the face to conservatives, Christians, families. I think you're causing more unnecessary frustration. Forced acceptance isn't acceptance, but we have always been able to coexist in our communities. Leaving conservatives out is not inclusion. We're demonized by the left every single day. I feel oppressed every single second. Where's my sidewalk painting? And Quincy, give up your multi-millionaire lifestyle for Black Lives Matter and then come talk to us. You don't know anything and you're way too young. You don't even know anything about life. You go around taking pictures of a privileged life and then come and talk to adults about how we're supposed to be. We're trying to work for you. It's your safety that matters. Can you direct your comments to the council rather to the other speakers? You know, it's all one and the same. You guys are all a team working to just exclude us, eliminate us and remove us so that it can be the established elite and the poor. And it's sick. We know what you're doing. <laughs> it's not as you guys know what's going on. It's happening around the country. You're all being exposed. You should really step down. You're a disgrace. And I'm really questioning your connections to the CCP, especially you, Mariko. Have a good day. Next speaker is Christy Harrington. Hi, thank you. I appreciate your time this evening. Um, I am calling in about uh, item number 13. Uh, with the uh, crosswalk, the pride um, stripe on the crosswalk. I just feel that um, it's a special interest for a special group. And uh, as much as we love everyone, um, this opens the door to basically all special interest groups that want their flag or their recognition, whether it's um, uh, the Audubon Society or uh, Boy Scouts. Uh, number one is my uh, concern for um, highlighting a special interest um, and excluding other folks. Um, and number two, we also have to be fiscally responsible um, every time we want to um, highlight a special interest, there's another $5,000 or $10,000. Um, and it, it needs to be um, something that just covers uh, everyone, uh, the entire public. And um, how about a great American flag because we're all Americans. Um, I appreciate your time and uh, would vote no for this uh, sidewalk 
initiative. Thank you. Next speaker is Suen Lorick. Sue Ann, it looks like you've been given um, permission to talk. If you could just unmute yourself. Thank you, I'm sorry. Um, hi, I'm Sue Ann Lorig, and I want to commend the council for the work they're doing on inclusivity. And I strongly support items three and 13. I did not come here um, tonight to knowing about these items on the consent agenda, but Hearing the other speakers, I felt compelled to tell you that yes, I do support them. Um, members of the GLBTQ plus community um, have been ostracized, they've been killed for years. They are not a special interest, they have been excluded. Whereas cis people, straight, whatever you want to call it, have been just normalized. So we don't need, I'm, I'm straight, we don't need special attention. We don't need to be recognized. But people that have been ostracized, we need to treat them fairly and recognize their worth and their dignity. And I think that these measures are, are wonderful. And as far as the pronouns, I think that gender neutral pronouns are wonderful. They is great. Um, there are other pronouns that they're coming up with that there's an eagle, easy Google search to find them all. And uh, I know we don't wanna call half he and half she. There are other ways to go about that. And if you need people to help paint the sidewalk a beautiful rainbow, count me in, I'll be there and I'll find volunteers. So yes, let's include all, let's support all of this um, diversity and equity and inclusivity. Thank you. Next speaker is Kai. Hi, um, can you guys hear me? I'm not sure. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hi, um, my name is Kay. Um, I don't have any actually prepared, but I'm just listening to these people that are talking. Um, I just have an experience that I wanna share with you guys a couple months ago. Um, I had this Zoom call meeting about, um, it's a doctor's meeting. And then they actually asked me that if I prefer to be called um, male or female. But I was like, I, I was on a video call and I think I look good. And I feel like offended for asking me. So I feel like, do I, do I look like a man for asking me if I prepare like to be called a male? So, I mean, it doesn't really matter, I guess, how many, how much or how big rainbow flag that you guys put in there. In my own opinion, um, if we just put God in our family, this LGBTQ people will be satisfied with the attention, the love that their parents give them. So please don't divide us. Don't put any discrimination. Let's just accept everyone. It doesn't matter what our their gender is. And to be honest, I came from the Philippines that Philippines is known for the big, gay country in the in, in the whole world we ha I have a lot of gay guy cousins and transgender friends i totally accept them and they accept everybody but we are in the people in the philippines we are not crying that we are not really accepted even though we're, there's actually a lot of discrimination there but now here in america what else do you guys need and what do you guys want i mean we have already gay marriage is still not enough what's next a human being and married to the dog? Come on now, guys. Please, let's stop this. What solidarity is required actually in Los Gatos? Who are the bigots? What are they specifically doing this to the people? Are you guys really proud of the sex? I think as a woman, 
I feel so offended for asking me if I prefer like to be called like a man. If you guys worry about their feelings, how about how, what I feel? And I think these people, and I have a lot of gay friends, they are satisfied and they're proud of who they are because they are actually contented what their friends and their parents and family, how they um, accepted them. But these stupid people, I'm sorry for lacking of attention and love from their family and they feel like they're not accepted. I mean, I think these are people, it doesn't matter what you do to them. It will never end. They were always gonna cry and bleed. What's next? In what extent are we actually gonna fight for these people? If I do believe, if we just gonna pull. And our next speaker is Kareem. Uh, peace and blessings, everyone. Uh, thank you. My name is Kareem Sayed. I'm part of the Faith Council of, of Los Gatos, and I wanted to uh, speak on consent items 3 and 13, and um, or 3 and 10. Or I, I hope I got the numbers right. Um, and I've been to various services throughout the community, from uh, the Jewish community to various Christian denominational churches. And what I can say is that we support these uh, initiatives because we recognize as a religious community that even if our religion in terms of our practices might not um, completely fall in line with some of these lifestyles. But what we also recognize is that we do have a freedom in this country and that we should be allowing and making sure that we're making individuals who are feeling excluded to let them feel that they're included. And what I'm kind of concerned about is that a lot of the speakers have brought up Christian values. And what I can say is from all the Sunday services that I've attended, again, from various denominations, They've all talked about being caring and compassionate to one another and for our fellow human beings. And to call on these values and then to state that these are the values that are the only ones that are representative and that they mean that we should be exclusive. And also what it's, you know, what, what's concerning to me is again, is the rhetoric and the type of, you know, tone that we're taking or discussing. I don't believe that if we believe Jesus may peace and blessing be upon him, that he is a prophet or he, he is somebody who is the Lord that, he advocated for us to go and start, you know, using foul language or being kind of, you know, rude and obnoxious when we're talking to one another. And so while I, again, I understand that, yes, as, as conservative, and I'm considering myself a conservative faith living individual, that yes, you know, um, there, there are issues out there where we feel that we're, our faiths are being attacked and that we're not allowed to experience them. For example, the example that one of the speakers gave about, uh, Chris, uh, about Christmas, um, we need to understand that and also you know, be able to live that experience and not feel that we're excluded. But on the same token, it doesn't make sense that we're making these false equivalencies that you know, just because we want to you know, paint rainbow stripes in, in the crosswalk and, and address you know, gender neutrality for, for individuals who are feeling that they are being excluded based on the type of gender uh, pronouns that we're using. I mean, it's, it just doesn't make any sense. And that we are a community that is moving towards, you know, uh, being more inclusive. And yeah, there's going to be some pain points because it's going to mean that we're going to be changing and making doing things a little bit differently. But in the end of the day, I think we all, as a majority of the community, support, you know, all the efforts that the town council is making. And thank you again for all your efforts. Next speaker is Wigsy Sivertson. Okay. There, you go. there you go. Yeah, I don't like this man, this way of doing things. Yeah, I want to say a few things. I have lived in Los Gatos since 1950. And one of the reasons I live here is because as a lesbian, I feel comfortable. It's disturbing to me to hear people talk about our community in ways that are so wrong and, and so misinformed. It's kind of sad, actually. Uh, but I really support putting the rainbow flag in the, in the crosswalks and changing the pronoun things. There are more if people read rather than just two genders. There actually are five different genders. I don't hear much about that. But uh, I just want to support our, our being able to live in a town that celebrates everybody. Because we want to have a flag on our crosswalk doesn't mean we don't want any other flag, crosswalk to have a flag. As far as I'm concerned, paint all the flags on crosswalks of various groups, make us the inclusive group that we should be. Thank you. Okay. And I have no other hands raised for consent agenda. 
Again, this is for items one through 18. Seeing no other hands raised, I am gonna close public testimony on consent. Um, council members, any member of council can pull an item from the consent agenda. And I look to council if there is anyone. Yes, Vice Mayor Rennie. I'd like to comment on item six, but I don't need to pull it when you'd like me to comment. Um, you may comment as well. And so just wanna go ahead, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I, I realize item three and 13 are very important for many people, but I wanted to draw attention to item six, which is also a very important item um, about homeless. It, it, at the time of the report, there's 10,000 homeless in the county and only about 20% of those are, ho are housed with some sort of supportive housing. Um, the other 80% are out on the street. Um, and a, a couple other things in the report that are interesting to note in the time frame from 2000 to 2015, the 10th percentile, in other words, the poorest people, um, their income declined 12%. So they got poorer over that period of time. Um, and if you think about how much housing is available to the very poor, the zero to 50% AMI, there's only enough housing to house 34% of them, um, that housing that is at that rental rate in the county. And at the zero to 80%, there's only 46%. Um, another important thing to note in the report is for every homeless family or individual that is connected to, to housing, two to three more are experiencing homelessness. Um, so if you think about this, that means that this, if this trend continues in the next five years, we could have 20,000 more homeless in Los Gatos, or not in Los Gatos, in the county. Um, so I'm happy that Los Gatos would um, support the county's plan um, 2025 targets um, to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Council Member Hudas. Uh, thank you. I had really a procedural question since we've adopted this new format. Um, if um, I were to have a question of the town attorney on any of these items, would that require pulling the items from the consent calendar? And Mr. Schultz, if you could, um, because this is new, if you could help guide us. So. Are you, you can ask those brief questions now, so long as it's not going to take a long discussion. But if you have just brief questions, you could ask those now. Okay. So if I may, uh, I wonder, Mr. Schultz, if uh, you have any uh, comment on the legality of items three and 13 um, beyond what's in the staff report. So as far as three, many, many cities and towns are going to general neutral. Um, our municipal code company that, that does our code is the company that will be going through the entire code. Right now, almost all the references are he, so they will making those general neutral and there's no legality of whether you've made those changes or not. Um, as far as 13 goes, there are two ways that the town has designed immunity under the California code. One is if a registered professional engineer signs off on a uh, design that has been approved, the design has been approved by standards. And in this case, our design professional could not do that. The other way you have design immunity is if it if the plan or design is approved by the legislative body. And that's why it's in front of you. Our professional engineers could not sign off on this because it's not a uh, approved standard, but the council certainly can, and we would have design immunity if there was an accident. That doesn't mean we wouldn't be sued if there was an accident in the intersection, but that's going to happen regardless of whether the color is or not. But we do have defenses and design immunity because we are bringing it in front of you for approval. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes, Council Member Badami. A question uh, also probably for the town attorney um, regarding item number 13. Are the markings considered permanent or temporary? For the crosswalk. I think that's a question more for um, uh, PPW. 
Good evening, Matt Morley, Director of Parks and Public Works. Um, so mar markings are, are temporary in nature, but we are going with a, a long-term temporary marking. So these are uh, meant to be there until we resurface the roadway at the, at the least, at which point that they would be uh, removed and um, we would redesign the roadway at that time. So what would be the longevity? Um, based on the uh, age of that street, I'm going to say uh, seven to 10 years, something along that line. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, and so uh, I asked the council um, if anyone li would like to pull an item. Seeing no one pull an item, would anyone like to make a motion for approval? Council Member Badami? I don't see anyone pulling an item and I don't intend to. So I move to approve the consent items one through 18. And may I have a second? Second. Okay, so I'll call the question. Again, this is regarding consent. Council Member Badami? Aye. Council Member Hudis? Aye. Vice Mayor Rennie? Aye. I also vote aye and the consent agenda passes unanimously. We now move to verbal communication where anyone from the public has an opportunity to speak on items that are not on the agenda. We have four remaining items on our agenda. And so again, you'll have three minutes. You'll have an opportunity to speak. For the benefit of the community, I do wanna remind that we ask everyone to follow our meeting guidelines and to treat everyone with respect and dignity. We are giving everyone an opportunity to speak tonight and we ask that you limit your issues and not to personalities. And we're giving everyone that voice to be respectful. And so with that, um, I will call on Eden Berg. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Major Marino, excuse me, I mean, Mayor Mariko, I was confused as to your stance on diversity, equity, and inclusion until I saw the name Berkeley in your bio. Now I know exactly why you are sitting in the seat that you are. I can't believe I have to tell a Berkeley graduate that critical race theory and diversity, equity, and inclusion is exactly the same thing, unless she is directly connected to terrorist terrorist organizations like Black Lives Matter, which by the way, she is executive director of CASI, which is directly responsible for installing DEI in schools all over the Bay Area. The same DEI that has been banned by many states. People from all over the world have found refuge in our town just to find the same agendas, programs, and curriculums that decimated their countries and destroyed their families. This should be a huge red flag with Chinese Communist Party written all over it. DEI is extremist and racist with anti-white and anti-Semitic ideology and will be taught in our classrooms. All the members on the council in front of me today are white. Are you so naive to think that you will not be affected too, as well as the lives of your children and grandchildren? Mayor Mariko, you were born on a naval base. You have a wonderful Filipino heritage. I have no doubt that your grandparents, great grandparents, cousins, uncles and aunts paid with their lives to fight the evil that you are ready to release into our communities. Not only have you sold out your own husband and children, but you have turned your back on your proud Filipino heritage. Remove DEI from our schools, government and institutions. It is divisive, it is racist. And while on the topic of racism, by forming this town's anti-racist coalition, you are essentially telling your constituents that they have a serious racist problem. Mayor, I have meaningful relationships and friendships with Africans, African-Americans, Latinos, Japanese, Filipinos. We don't care if you're pink, orange, yellow, green, purple, or the entire unicorn. We are all one people on God's green earth. Stop identity politics now. Thank you. Next speaker is Amy. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak again. Uh, I just um, wanted to thank the town council for their efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion here in Los Gatos. Uh, I think he's been very brave uh, to take this on given the opposition I've heard this evening. Uh, so thank you for your efforts. I also support the Chamber's Listen, Learn, Change, Grow um, campaign. The signs are a great step in a very good direction and I sincerely hope that the town is gonna continue their efforts. Um, know that uh, personally, I believe uh, a majority of town residents uh, would support these efforts. Um, obviously not all residents support them as, we, as we've heard today. Um, and I would like to clarify um, that uh, Mayor Sayok did not form the anti-racist coalition here in Los Gatos. That coalition was formed uh, by Los Gatos residents who wanted to work to combat racism. Uh, thank you. Next speaker is Lisa Wade. Hi, my name is Lisa Wade, and I just wanted to thank the town so much for your um, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. These are really important efforts, and I feel that there are many, many residents who feel the same way. They're not all here speaking tonight. And many people um, wanted to speak, but we didn't want to keep you up all night. So just know that you have the support of many, many residents. We're very grateful for your work. Um, we also want to support um, the anti-racist coalition in Los Gatos, and we're grateful for all of the work that they are doing. And we are also grateful for the work of the Chamber of Commerce and um, their efforts. So just know that you do have a lot of support from, from residents for your diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Thank you. Next speaker is Peter Neumer. There we go. Hi, sorry about that. Hi, my name is Peter Neumer. Um, I'm, I think I'm a familiar face and voice to some of you. Uh, I've been a Los Gatos resident for uh, 18 years and I've served on the board of trustees for the Los Gatos Union School District since 2014. So in the middle of my second term, um, I probably don't tune into town council meetings as often as I should have, should, um, but I did happen to do so last uh, two weeks ago, Tuesday, June 1st, uh, when the town council was uh, reappointing youth commissioners. I'm fortunate to have my younger son participate in that activity and I appreciate it. Uh, the council for keeping that going over the years and through pandemic. Um, as I listened in, I listened to this section of public comment then, and I was at first surprised and then appalled and disgusted uh, hearing uh, all the negative comments I heard about the town's initiative, uh, Listen, Learn, Change, Grow, um, for a couple of reasons, and I'll, I'll sort of spell those out here. First off, um, I find it uh, inaccurate, it is inaccurate and I find it extremely lazy for people to take what the town is doing for diversity and inclusiveness and just simply label it critical race theory and then use that as a, as a way to bash it. Um, I don't, it's not crystal clear to me that these people know what critical race theory is. It's not crystal clear to me that they've looked at anything that the town's doing because their comments don't relate to any of the substance. Um, and I, I found that again, somewhat appalling. Uh, even worse, though, many of the speakers on the first uh, likened what the town is doing to how Hitler and Nazi Germany got their start. Uh, and I find that, uh, again, both inaccurate and frankly disgusting. Um, I myself am Jewish. Um, my father and his family, they're, they're from Germany. He immigrated to the U.S. as a young child in the 1930s for obvious reasons. And I can speak from you know, personal knowledge of my family history, of things I've studied over the years and, and museums and such that I've visited, that what we're doing now is absolutely not uh, the way uh, things got started in Nazi Germany. In fact, it's somewhat ironic that um, the, the, the more, more direct comparison with Germany is what Germany did in the aftermath of World War II 
to try to make amends for the atrocities. Um, they did exactly what we're trying to do now, which is to openly confront and acknowledge issues from the past and address them in a way that's equitable for everybody. Um, uh, I, I'm fortunate I and my siblings and my, and my father before he passed away had maintained ties to a community in Germany where our grandfather was born. And my siblings and I sit on the volunteer board of an organization that maintains and operates a former synagogue uh, as a museum to the heritage of the Jewish people in the area. Um, so I wanna commend the town council for the work that they're doing now and in the future. And uh, I hope it continues as successfully as we expect it to, thank you. Next speaker is Quincy. Hello again, and good evening council members. I'm here tonight to talk about some of the remarks I've heard during past meetings. I've heard a lot of people come forward during verbal communications and talk about their beliefs that the town of Los Gatos is pushing racist views, which I believe to not be true. I have also heard people compare Los Gatos to Nazis and other horrible groups. This is, only ex this is not only extremely insensitive to many throughout our town, but I believe, again, it is just not true. Being able to come tonight and express your concerns is a privilege that many across our world do not have, especially in socialist countries that we are often compared to. It is sad that people in this town still believe that we are a communist dictatorship, while many are using their First Amendment rights by coming tonight and speaking at this meeting. I would also like to comment about the remarks made by a lot of people about the listen, learn, change, grow signs placed around downtown. People have compared them to the KKK, and these signs were put up for the sole purpose of addressing racial justice and anti-discrimination. I encourage everyone making these comparisons to do more research into what the Ku Klux Klan has actually done to our country. I would also like to ask anyone speaking during tonight's meeting or any future meetings to not use these insensitive and heartless comparisons to cruel and dehumanizing groups when their political beliefs are not aligned with something going on around town. I, along with the youth of the town, would like to thank the council for all that they have done, calling the town socialists and accusing them of pushing propaganda for educating their citizens about racial problems going on in our country is not right. And like I mentioned before, comparing our elected government to evil dictatorships will help no one and only divide us more. Thank you. Next speaker, Sasha. Good evening, council members. Thank you for giving me this time to speak. I would also like to bring up something that greatly disturbed me at the last town council meeting on June 1st during verbal communications. Someone had brought up that the council members are pushing the vaccine and quote unquote, went on to say that none of the council members have done proper research and promoting false information. I would like to respond to this comment as a member of this community. I attended the COVID-19 community training program with the Santa Clara County of Public Health recently. In this training, a doctor, Dr. Golden, spoke about the science behind the vaccine development, how it works, why it is safe and effective, as well as gave us plenty of time to ask questions so that all of us were fully aware and were not spreading any possible, quote unquote, false information. Coming out of this meeting, I felt like I gained a much greater knowledge of the vaccine and felt increasingly more confident in knowing that when I receive my vaccine, I will be safe. I am proud to say that I received my second and final dose this morning. I understand that many people have different opinions, and I completely respect and acknowledge the different perspectives of people in our community. I believe hearing different people is such a valuable part in making a diverse community like Los Gatos. However, I would also like to mention that it is unfair to assume that people are not doing their due diligence to learn information, and saying council members and other professionals who have spoken up about it should be, quote unquote, ashamed of themselves. I fully recommend having conversations with doctors and health professionals like many people across our city and county have done, and then you can make a decision for yourself. Finally, I would like to state, as a proud youth of this town, I am in full support of the rainbow stripes on the crosswalk and I am so grateful of this community I am raised in. Additionally, for the concern of the speaker who previously mentioned Cassie, as someone who has used and knows many people who use Cassie, it is an extremely beneficial service for so many people at my school. I would like to greatly thank the council for all their support and inclusivity for understanding all members of the people in this town. Thank you. Next speaker, Sue Ann Lorig.
Hello again. I'm Sue Ann Lorig. I'm from the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Los Gatos, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Fellowship Social Action Committee tonight on this issue. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. And thank you, Mayor Sayhawk and town council members so much for adopting the resolution denouncing hatred and violence toward diverse Los Gatos communities on April 6th, for your welcoming statement on becoming an inclusive community, and for your collaboration with the Los Gatos Chamber of Commerce on the diversity, equity, and inclusivity initiative, including the banners around town with the wonderful message to listen, learn, change, and grow. Unitarian Universalists, or UUs, are committed to seven principles that include the worth of each person, the need for justice and compassion, and the right to choose one's own beliefs. Our UU principles call us to affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations and the goal of world community. Our faith tradition is diverse and inclusive. In 1997, recognizing that racism and its effects, including economic injustice, are embedded in all social institutions as well as in ourselves and will not be eradicated without deliberate engagement in analysis and action, the Unitarian Universalist Association, the central organization for the EU religious movement in the US, passed its own anti-racism resolution. It's long and beautiful, and you're welcome to read it at uua.org. Our seventh principle calls for respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we're a part. In other words, we're all interconnected. There are ripple effects from all our actions, whether they be from love or hate or with kindness or brutality. The town's actions on anti-racism of which I'm speaking tonight are clearly from a place of loving kindness. I affirm support for the town's actions on anti-racism. I ask this, may each person, town and entity resolve to be anti-racist and to speak up for anti-racism. May we all recognize our interconnectedness and be filled with loving kindness. May we all be safe and protected. May we all be healthy and well in all aspects of our beings. May we go forth and be the change we wish to see. Thank you. Speaker is Alicia Cinema Stereo. Hello, I called into the city council meeting because I want to thank the council and the chamber of commerce for having the courage to initiate necessary but difficult conversations within our community that is desperately needed for growth and development. The Listen, Learn, Change, Grow campaign did not cause division in Los Gatos because the Listen, Learn, Change, Grow campaign was made because of existing division in Los Gatos. What people don't realize is that they're calling in to protest the banners is them unknowingly participating participating in what the Listen, Learn, Change, Grow campaign was made to do. It is bringing to light discussions that need to be had for growth and understanding. I am grateful to City Council for taking this seriously and discussing it. It is because of this campaign that it is now clearer more than ever that Los Gatos has some serious healing to do. The beginning steps for that healing is communication, and so I applaud the Chamber of Commerce for making history in Los Gatos for gracefully tackling the difficult and sensitive issues issue of racism. Please pay attention to what has been happening to people in our community that have decided to openly support diversity and stand in solidarity with people of color in this community. They have become targets. That backlash that you see them receive is the same hate that people of color have been telling you about. Now you see the harassment tactics, the intimidation tactics. Now do you see? To people listening who support diversity in Los Gatos, I thank you. Please listen to the speakers today. Identify and see through the increasingly desperate, quick to change tactics in opposition to equality and stand with us against hate. A few things to leave with you, and I say these things with incredible amounts of kindness in my heart, is this. People of color are not going to stop fighting for their rights. 
people of color know and can identify the tactics that have been used throughout history to attempt to gaslight us and twist our intentions. There is no conspiracy. There are only human beings who want equality. And in this fight for freedom, it is not to decline the rights of those who benefit from this current system. It is to have their rights for everyone. People of color are not stupid. We know the true history and we will teach it to our children when they get home with their false history books. This is how I was taught and how my mother was taught. And what has happened to us as indigenous peoples has been well documented. The true history is going to come out. Equality is only a matter of time. It is coming. The question you should ask yourself is, do you or do you not possess insecurities within yourself that invokes fear at this thought of equality and begin a very real and profound discussion within yourself? I would like for you to sit back and just think about the energy of what you are feeling as these speakers speak. Is it fear or is it love? And I think it should be very clear on how we need to move forward. Thank you. Next speaker is Donna Lee. Hi again. So my name is Donna Lee and I'm a young resident of Los Gatos. I have lived here for 23 years and my parents met here. They were married at St. Mary's. I attended, I attended K through eight there and living here has been a great joy for me. As we all know, the pandemic brought out the worst in some people, many who have taken the public forum, social media, and even the corner of the town square to voice their hate, spew horrific comments and divide us further. It disgusts me that we have people attacking youth members of our community on social media or what we even just saw here tonight. We need to take those threats seriously. I would like to thank the town council for their strides to connect Los Gatos and put it into a town for all. The listen, learn, change, grow signs make me smile whenever I see them. And if anyone sees them as something other than a call for growth as a community, shame on them. The words at past meetings and those harmful ones said tonight here disgust me as a fellow resident. I applaud all of your strength as you sit here on Tuesday nights, enduring the slander and horrible statements thrown at you through your computer screens. You do not deserve that. I apologize on behalf of those who have nothing better to do than come on here and spew anger. They do not represent Los Gatos. And I hope the choices and action done by the town council can show non-residents that this is the town where you can be yourself, entirely you, and not be subjected to discrimination or hate crimes. I have every intention of living in, in this town until I am old, raising my kids here and being so proud of the town I call home. I want a town where my kids feel safe, where my kids feel welcome, and where my kids see the change that we have made, hopefully in these upcoming years, and how we fought for the common good. But I also want them to learn that we powered through tough times. We still have a lot of growing and learning to do. So thank you again for trying to be a part of the change and working towards a more inclusive, diverse, and welcoming town. Have a good evening. Next speaker is Ms. Javi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, council members and staff. Thank you for this opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Maureen Kaplan Javi. I'm a longtime Los Gatos resident, and I'm here this evening to voice my support for the town's DEI initiatives, diversity, equity, and inclusivity, specifically the multi-layered effort to grow Los Gatos as an inclusive community. I'm also here on behalf of Together We Will Indivisible Los Gatos to offer full-throated support of the multi-year Listen, Learn, Change, Grow campaign recently launched by the Chamber of Commerce in partnership with the Los Gatos Library, the Anti-Racism Co Coalition, New Museum Los Gatos, the Arts and Culture Commission and others. I'm an active member of TWW Los Gatos, which is comprised of over 350 individuals, mostly local folks from the South Bay and many from across the Bay Area and the state. We are an inclusive network of global citizens and everyday activists, united in our enduring commitment to support efforts that strengthen our democracy. Our mission perfectly aligns with the town's DEI goals and the Listen, Learn, Change, Grow campaign. We look forward to collaborating with the town, LLCG, and the growing list of community partners. You know, over the past few weeks, I've been listening to the public commentary portion of council meetings. I've been listening to the shameful and misguided pushback against the democracy strengthening efforts being made in my town 
pushback from individuals who are clearly terrified that the world is changing and their place in it is becoming less relevant and certainly less welcomed. And by listening, I'm learning that these folks live lives filled with hatred, intolerance, and fear. Personal growth, intellectual growth are clearly not their priorities, but change is coming, good change and necessary change. I am thankful to my town's leaders, the TWW community, and my friends and family for encouraging and supporting my own efforts to listen, learn, change, and grow, to lift all boats and create a world where diversity, equity, and inclusivity form the new foundation upon which we'll all live and thrive. Si se puede. Thank you for listening. Next speaker is Karen Rubio. Hi again, uh, Mayor Sayoc and Town Council. Um, my name is Karen Rubio and I'm speaking now as a member of Plant-Based Advocates. Our group wrote up a statement recently supporting the town's efforts toward diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And we fully support your efforts in that regard. Um, we did this because we have been listening to some of the comments and we are appalled um, at some of the things people have been saying and the personal attacks. I think for anybody who looks at history, it's quite evident that our country was based on um, killing the uh, indigenous people and bringing people over from Africa to force into slavery. And although we have obviously grown since then, um, it, our country still has problems. Um, and just because we talk about those problems doesn't make us racist. Um, I think that the practice of identifying and discussing occurrences of racial inequity, bias, injustice, and hate is key to resolving conflict and a necessary step in becoming a more inclusive and just community and nation. Um, we also want to say that we support the efforts in regards to the anti-racism coalition and their work in bringing about inclusivity for everybody in the town. And in conclusion, I just wanna say um, to the people who are maybe afraid or opposed to having these conversations with people, when in doubt, compassion is always the right choice. If people share their experiences of being excluded or being subject to hate, that's their experience. You can't argue with somebody's feeling or experience. So try to listen with an open heart and it can only make our town better. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Shasta Erickson. Oh, hello. Um, my son went to six years of school in Los Gatos High. He's half Asian and um, I, I saw bullying that happened to him, racial slurs, and a lot of bullying happening to, to everybody, uh, white, white, especially white girls. And I didn't get any help at all from the school or Cassie or even the police department. And my son was suicidal. And I know suicide is a is a big problem in Los Gatos. And I didn't get help even from the politicians. So where I'm coming from is I'm all for support for anti-racism and equity. However, after what happened to me in your town, I have a lot of mistrust about any agenda that might be behind where this is coming from. And that isn't to say that I'm not 100% supportive of anti-racism, my son is half Asian. I feel that we haven't been tolerant of each other's views. And it's like a one-sided view in that town. It's a very Democrat. And I, I personally voted Libertarian. So I, I didn't vote either way. But I feel people have not been tolerant to the Asian Republicans who feel that the election was stolen and don't believe in these mandates and they do feel like it's an overreach into their 
this, this, what their science tell them, because there is the great Barrington declaration that has over 50,000 doctors who did not think the lockdowns were advisable. They felt we should have focused protection and protect our elders. And that there's been great turmoil and distress and destruction to the average citizen who isn't rich like the people in Los Gatos. And I, I believe in listening to everybody because, you know, I, um, I'm friends with everybody. And I, I would like to encourage the town to be more understanding of where each side is coming from and more tolerant rather than labeling each other, to be more tolerant of each other so we don't fall into the same thing of what I saw happen to my son in that school. And also be, be aware of false flags because there have been a lot of potential false flags and we can't get distracted by one agenda. I'm 100% for anti-racism. So if it's, if it's not going to turn people, kids against each other, I'm all for it. I just wanted to give my viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you. And um, as we have with our policies and procedures, we limit our verbal communications to the first 30 minutes so that we can get to the other items that are on our public hearing. For all those that have their hands raised, we will continue verbal communications at the end of the meeting. And those that have not had an opportunity to speak on an item that is not on the agenda will have an opportunity to do so. And again, thank you for all those that spoke um, and thank you for listening and um, thank you for listening. We now move to our public hearing. We're moving to item number 19, which is to authorize the following actions for landscape and lighting assessment districts. So, welcome, Stephanie. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. Uh, tonight, um, I am presenting the report for the landscape and lighting. On an annual basis, the town conducts a process for property assessments for its six landscape and lighting assessment district benefit zones. And the primary purpose of the districts is to provide for the ongoing maintenance and care of landscape areas that especially benefit the properties within each of these zones. Uh, the item before you is the final report for this year uh, with the required public hearing and a recommended action of adopting these six resolutions which will authorize the collection of set assessments for the fiscal year 2021-22. No protests or any written communication has been received by staff. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Hockmeyer. Council members, any questions? I see none. So I will go to our public. And again, our public will have three minutes to speak to this item, which is lighting and landscape assessments for districts one and two. And so I see two hands raised. First speaker is Carrie. Sorry, I meant to un raise my hand, sorry. No worries. Next speaker, Doug Case. Um, I had raised my hand to talk earlier and I don't care to talk on the landscaping topic. Okay. Okay. So I see no other hands raised. So I will close public testimony. We go back to council and I look to council for either a question that may have occurred, comment, and motion. Vice Mayor Rennie. Um, Mayor, I'll make a motion that we authorize the actions A through F in our staff report. Thank you. And do I have a second? Council Member Badami? Second. <laughs> Thank you. Any comments to the motion? Seeing none, let's call it. Council Member Badami? Aye. Council Member Hudis? Aye. Vice Mayor Rennie? Aye. I also vote aye. And um, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hockmeyer. We now move to item 20. If you could just give me a quick minute. 
and that is to receive the Community Health and Senior Services Report on Senior Service Provision and Assessment Recommendations. So. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Town Council. So you will call back in March, the Town Council held a joint session with the Community Health and Senior Service Commission. And at that time, there was a lot of discussion about what is the actual state of uh, senior services in the town? And are there any areas where perhaps we are lacking in service provision? And so council directed the Community Health and Senior Service Commission to go ahead and do an assessment and then come back to council. And that would be this evening with their review and their assessment. As you can see in the staff report, the Commission took your uh, guidance very seriously. They had a accelerated meeting schedule and they brought in quite a few service providers in the area. And then through that kind of presentation and assessment, you can see that they identified that one, there is a pretty strong ecosystem of senior service provision in the town in terms of nutritional needs and in terms of availability of certain uh, recreational services. But they did, as they dug deeper, start to also see that when you look at uh, our town compared to some of our peers, there are areas where there could probably be improvements in service. And then this culminated with a final table that starts on page five of the staff report, where they broke down certain areas, they identified the issue, and then I, they identified potential short-term proposals and long-term proposals. I will note that while the commission was in pretty strong agreement of kind of the high level areas where they thought they could be improvement, they did not necessarily come forward with a singular recommendation for each one of those issues. And so that's why the table is formatted the way it is. And so this evening is an opportunity for the council to review the assessment and provide any additional guidance to staff or to the commission to do further work on any area that's identified by the council. And with that, we're available for questions. I'm taking a quick look at the attendees. I see that we do have several of our commissioners in attendance. And so if you have questions of the commissioners, we also have, I'm seeing, at least two in attendance. And then I'm also seeing some of our service providers in attendance. Thank you very much. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to see first, uh, Vice Mayor Rennie, thank you for um, agreeing to serve as a, as a delegate, as a liaison uh, to the commission. And um, I wanted to see if council members had any initial questions before I open to public testimony. Okay, seeing none, I am going to ask um, Tom Pacro of our public and, and again, remind anyone in the public who would like to speak on um, the Senior Services Commission and the work that has been done, please, now is your time. And Mr. Pacro, welcome. Um, good evening, thank you. And uh, thank you for hearing me. Uh, and for your work with the commission on uh, uh, doing a more thorough analysis of senior uh, issues. Uh, they say you can look at an entity's budget and see its uh, priorities. And the Los Gatos is spending in the area of senior uh, needs have been rather minimal in uh, the last decade from my perspective. And I think it's time to change your priorities uh, or to increase your priorities for our growing senior population. So I just like to encourage you uh, that while we recognize financial resources are limited uh, and you can't solve the problem overnight, there might be things you could do. Uh, and so why not do some modest investments in existing facilities? Uh, why not hold a town workshop uh, on senior issues and uh, help to develop a community path forward for our older adults. Uh, why not establish a study group to develop a 10-year plan for an adequate senior center like we did for the library a few decades ago? Uh, why not contract for a coordinator to marshal the support of town volunteers who would like to support a more uh, inclusive and more socially active uh, senior social programs. 
so why not do some things? Why not do something? That would be my question to you. Thank you. Mr. Picro, next speaker, Dick Conrad. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Thank you. So the, uh, the some of the key things that are where we have tremendous gaps is is in our membership, and like we have had a we have eighty three right now. We've had highs in the several hundreds, whereas Saratoga, with a different business model, has two thousand, and and this is just <laughs> a, a, a serious deficiency. The other thing that in in the in the presentations, I mean, we have a tremendous amount of, of service providers in the community that are doing very good work. We have service clubs that really have been underutilized to, to help in the senior services area. And then we have many seniors that connect to, that would be happy to volunteer in the seniors to seniors program. And what we need is a centralized uh, facility or organization that connects all the dots in the community because all the dots are there. And that, that's the issue is how do we do that? And of course, there were several uh, uh, recommendations. Saratoga uh, has an outstanding program that we could uh, partner with, if that's possible. Uh, we could hire someone like all of our other sister cities have. And uh, I might add that during the pandemic, uh, they kept their staff, whereas unfortunately L LGS was, was losing money and they finance all of our senior 55 plus activities. So we were caught a little short there. Uh, and we also have proposals to increase funding to uh, uh, LGS, but we have to pick one of these uh, avenues and we have to increase funding to get to where we want to go. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Jeffrey Blum. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Okay, thank you. So as you all know, I'm on the uh, Community Health and Senior Services Commission, but I'm speaking on my own behalf, not on behalf of the commission. Um, I've given a lot of thought to uh, this issue. And um, of course I was involved in the work done to come up with the recommendations. My feeling is that there's no question uh, more money needs to be put forward by the town to improve uh, the services that can be provided to seniors uh, in the community. And as many people have pointed out, we have a very large senior uh, population uh, and it's only growing. So the issue is only gonna get worse or uh, more difficult to deal with. Uh, my concern is that we do not yet have enough information. It doesn't make sense to me to just uh, offer more money to, uh, for example, to LGS Rec. I saw their latest report and they had uh, a number of items mentioned where if you give us this much money, we can do this, but there's no meat on the bones. And so I agree with uh, Dick Conrad that there's much more work that needs to be done. Um, you need a detailed budget from LGS Rec, for example, you need to look into other options. For example, I, I made a suggestion of rather than uh, improving or renovating the uh, Rec Center, that in the short term, there'll be partnering with uh, some of the clubs in the area, for example, the club that is almost completed. Um, so there's much work to, more work to be done. Um, the idea of having a, uh, I think, 
once the town council receives a much more detailed budget from LGS Rec, uh, then that component uh, can be looked at in a uh, study group or whatever. Um, but, and, and I recognize that that is just one component of uh, address in addressing the needs of seniors, but that would be a good start. And then long-term there, there's also a, a, an urgent need to look into the option of building a new center. Uh, and so I, again, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I hope that uh, um, this is recognized. What we've provided as a commission uh, is only a, a first step. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blum. Ann Peterson. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm the uh, executive director of Live Oak Adult Day Service. Uh, Live Oak is a nonprofit community based adult daycare that serves frail seniors who can't live independently and we serve their caregivers. We're proud to say that our organization started in Los Gatos in 1983 and has served Los Gatos seniors ever since. As one of the senior service providers in Los Gatos, I'd like to offer our support to the idea that a lively senior center can become the hub for our community's care for its seniors. I feel the town could be more focused on seniors and their needs and to that end, I hope the town considers and approves some sort of improvements on the current senior center. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Lee Fago. Good evening, Madam Mayor and council members. Uh, this is a, a very critical topic for our town as was pointed out with the demographics of a much more mature population aging in place and being a larger part of our, our population. Um, much of the work that is currently being provided to our senior citizens is being done by volunteers who are doing a lot of the, of the work to help our senior citizens and their care providers. Um, that uh, the, uh, there are more than 20 organizations in, in town who are doing a lot of the work that, that is helping them. Uh, a lot of it is in collaboration as well with Montesorino and, and uh, Saratoga. Our local merchants have been very helpful in providing food services and working with the county as well to, to bring in some of those resources. So uh, it, it's pretty clear that much of what is being done to provide support to our seniors is being done by the community within the community but the town itself has not really done that much. The workshop brought out some of these issues and I think it, it's laid some groundwork on what else can be done. True, no specific suggestions were, were submitted. And I think that's because there's still more work that needs to be done in terms of research and finding ways of collaborating with other organizations. I would suggest another workshop to really do that, to take it to the next step. Um, the rec center itself, we've talked about it. Uh, it's the fact that it's a non-ADA compliant uh, and they're having to go in and, and redo the restrooms. You're doing that now, uh, as well as some other maintenance work. Um, it's, it's, it's a little embarrassing to, to think of that as our senior center was not being ADA compliant. Um, so the facility itself needs to be recast. And I think that's part of what a workshop could do would be look at what could be done with facilities themselves in terms of offering this, the, a site for various services to our community. So please consider creating um, a, a workshop so that further discussion with these groups can be done. They can collaborate together. The other thing is looking for funding for anything that does come forward. I've watched uh, previous councils, our town, shuffle funds from, from various, uh, various funds in order to meet uh, demands that are, were not in a budget. Um, and you've got the funds that can do that going forward. So please stay focused on this topic of senior services. See if we can set up a workshop and collaborate with various organizations. 
um, non other nonprofits uh, in other communities as well. And let's work together to solve this problem before it gets worse because we are all aging locally. Thank you. Yeah. And would anyone else like to speak on this item? Nancy Roulette? Can you hear me now? Yes, welcome. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. I'm the Executive Director of LGS Recreation and wish to express my thanks and gratitude for the work that the Community Health and Senior Services Commission has endeavored to do thus far and their report to Council. I agree with um, echoing similar sentiments to other speakers, including Lee's suggestion and, and Jeffrey's as well. And I think there's a bit more work that needs to be done. Um, we would be happy to come back with a more detailed budget about uh, what could be provided if we're given the, the direction and the authority to be able to help coordinate efforts with other service providers, with local emergents and, and, and the like. Um, but until that occurs, it's a little difficult to kind of pin that down and, and shore up what the specific needs are for the community. So I think further, further work and research is required to, um, to understand how we can best collaborate with one another. We do look forward to an opportunity to engage more deeply and completely with community members, particularly those who are a bit more isolated and vulnerable, especially as we're now re-emerging from um, the sheltering in place and we're beginning to expand our reach in the community. So we, we look forward to that. Thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, I see no hands raised, so I'm closing public testimony bringing this back to council for further discussion. Vice Mayor Rennie. Thank you, Mayor. I thought maybe I should start off with my, my thoughts since I've sat through, um, I think five, five meetings of the commission to, and I'd like to draw the council's attention to page four, um, the bottom table on page four. I, I think that tells the whole story if you, Look at the, the budget line on that. Um, Los Gatos had a budget of 100,000, but that's not money we put in. That was generated, um, LGS Rec generated that through the um, fees from the adult program, not the senior program, but the adult fees. Um, Los Gatos gave um, uh, uh, you know, subsidies towards the facility but if you compare to the other cities, they've all, they all do that also. So effectively compared to the other cities, we're not putting money into the senior program. We're using sort of a model where the fees off the adult program are letting us get away with um, a, a program in Los Gatos. So I would agree with several of the speakers you just heard that we've been significantly underfunding our, our senior programs in Los Gatos. Um, the, you know, the next, it, the table's a little hard to read, but you can see that many of the other cities, you know, the, the, Los Altos is the least with four, a $400,000 budget, but you've got Saratoga with a million dollar budget, which is coming some from, you know, Saratoga, I forgot what, they're putting in from their general fund, but they are putting in, you know, a lot more than us. Um, Campbell, you see it's coming from general fund and fees and they're three quarters of a million. So my, my point is, you know, we've, we've been limping by with really not putting much money in, um, in into the program. The question is, you know, how do we do a better job at, at funding this? I think, you know, the talk of, sending um, them back to figure out the meat and so forth is good, but not if we're not willing to commit the dollars to make it happen. Um, I, you know, in further, further down in the, under public comment, LGS Rec has provided um, slides that show, um, you know, what you could get for 100,000, 200,000 and so forth. And you, speakers mentioned that we really need a lot more meat on that. But I do sort of like the idea of um, the high-level items in there. 
And I believe, and I, Mr. Mr. Andrews can correct me, I believe we could probably use ARPA funds um, for that because we've already done our budget for this year. So where would money come from if we wanted to move something forward um, and not wait till next year's budget? Um, I believe we could use ARPA funds and I would suggest we might want to consider something like the 400,000 or the 500,000 level um, in that um, presentation they gave. Um, when I look through it, most of the line items from the 100 through the 500 that you would get are the high level items that are that I find interesting. Um, you know, of course, it'd be great to go even further, but that seemed like a sort of middle compromise level. And it still puts us spending less than our, our peers on senior services. And then you saw the desk item just to, you know, I also asked, well, what do we give in grants to be fair? And if you look at what we're giving in grants to senior type um, organizations in Los Gatos, it was about 70,000. So we really weren't giving zero, as I said, we're giving 70, which is still far less than what our, our peer cities are putting in from their general funds. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but you know, maybe as a, as a thinking starting point anyway. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Hudis. Uh, thank you. And I, I wanna thank the uh, commission for the work that was done given uh, the complexity and breadth of the issue. Uh, I've had the opportunity to listen in on many of the meetings and to uh, read the report carefully. And it, it really does seem as though a, an important step has been made to identifying some ideas that could be implemented uh, to satisfy the strategic priority that the council put forth in, in our annual set of priorities. Um, I wanted to maybe just start with a question um, and then maybe offer some more thoughts. By the way, just in reaction to um, the vice mayor's thought, I, I think it would be um, very important for us to do something short term while we are developing longer term plans. And so I am uh, supportive of uh, looking for some way uh, to carve out a certain amount of budget this year and identify uh, what you might call low hanging fruit that we could fund uh, that could get us a start in moving uh, toward a solution. Um, my question really about the report is I wanna understand there's you know this column uh, that is termed short-term proposals and long-term proposals. And Mr. Andrews, I think you use the word potential proposals. Um, are these recommendations? So the, the short-term proposals, thank you for the question, council member. It kind of encompasses the collective thoughts of the commission, but in most areas, they were not able to coalesce around one of the single proposals. And so for instance, uh, under the communication proposal, currently we know SASE has started distributing the Outlook publication in town. So one of the things we could do to make sure we maintain that type of medium that seniors uh, more relate to, which is a printed newspaper, we could just leverage the work that's already being done by SASE. Some of the other thoughts were, well, why don't we develop our own unique Los Gatos senior publication? So that's a different way of getting to the same objective. Uh, one of the other thoughts was we could increase market awareness, you know, through trying different things. And so there was no strong kind of consensus in a lot of these areas. Another good example would be when we start talking about, you know, additional service expansion or service coordination on multiple occasions we could easily you know, continue to leverage the relationship we currently have with LGS Rec. But as you heard from one or two of our commissioners tonight, there was also thoughts, well, maybe we reach out to a new provider, you know, similar to SASE or other providers. And so that's kind of why it's, it's laid out that way is because there was no final recommendation for each one of those high level areas. Okay, so if I wanted to just kind of summarize and my own way of takeaway on this is that 
and I heard you use the word could a lot of times, um, that these are, these are things that we could do, but we haven't really taken the step into what should we do and to have the council be able to then say, what will we do? Is that, is that correct? That would be correct. So for an issue that was identified, for instance, no dedicated budget or centralized senior communication and mediums, all the items in the short-term proposals would meet that objective. They're all things you could do. And then ultimately, once council provides direction on any of these items, then we will do what we do administratively and start figuring out the best way to operationalize that. Okay, thank you. It's very helpful for me to understand an assessment about how far we got and where we need to go. Thank you. And Council Member Badami? Thank you. Um, yes, looking at page four, um, I, I was shocked to see the membership at 83 down from 5,418. In fact, I even reached out to the town manager because I thought certainly there must be a, a typo error in this report. Um, so that's very concerning to me. Um, also to looking at the budget that we have in comparison to the other communities, it's weak. So I'm interested in what the vice mayor brought up and that can we use ARPA funds to budget the senior services and what would be the, the impact of 400 to 500,000 uh, being diverted? Uh, so that's my question to Mr. Andrews. Sure, thank you for the question. So the current understanding of the eligible guidelines, providing additional money for what would be considered uh, senior services, you know, seniors were heavily impacted as were lower income individuals during COVID. It would more than likely be deemed a, an eligible use in the, in the current environment. That's not to say a year from now or a year after that, it would still be deemed as an eligible use, but in the current environment, as we're just now coming out of COVID, it probably would be. There's, you know, one slight wrinkle, which is uh, LGS Rec is a JPA. They're not a uh, 501c3. Uh, it's clear an eligible use to nonprofits, but I think because of the nature of the service that we would be trying to acquire with ARPA funds, which would be dedicated to seniors, we would probably still be able to to ensure that that would be an eligible use. And in terms of unallocated ARPA funds to date. So the federal government gave their first calculation of what they believed our allotment was going to be. It's approximately $5.8 million, or sorry, $5.6 million. The state will recalculate that uh, because they're responsible for non-entitlement governments and doing that calculation. Uh, estimates are it'll probably be a little higher. And currently of the $5.6 million, council has not allocated approximately $2 million of that. Thank you. And so then my question, Mr. Andrews, um, and again, uh, I should know this, but given the process of where we are currently in our budget, is it, if we want, if we made some decisions tonight, uh, understanding that at least it's just guidance and, and asking for more information, but give you a ballpark, is that something that you would just amend onto the budget or is that something that would feed into well, I guess I'll leave it open-ended. How would that process work? Huh? So with the budget adopted uh, two weeks ago, we would need to find funding for this, which means it would require a budget amendment. If that were to be ARPA funds, you know, there are currently unallocated funds. And so we would come with a budget amendment for that. If you were wanting staff to go back and look at the entire budget and perhaps change what was already agreed to operationally, that would be, that would be a little different. And if there's been some discussion of potential improvements to the facility, to the extent that there are unallocated CIP funds, you know, we would have to look to the director of public works to opine on that. During the budget actions, there were some unallocated funds that were brought forward to the CIP. So there could be some room there, but once again, the director of public works would have to go back and look at their budget relative to what was done two weeks ago to see if there's any unallocated CIP funds. Thank you. Okay, council. Um, so I look to all of you on um, 
ideas on how you would like to move forward? Council Member Hudis? Um, so, you know, assessing where we are on this is really important. And I think that while it might be possible to uh, move forward on a budgetary basis on some uh, short term recommendations, I don't think that solves the problem in really addressing the needs of our 60 plus community. So uh, as the vice mayor said and pointed out that we are um, substantially underfunding this community. In addition, this community is growing. So at the time our funding is decreasing, the, the community is growing. And so um, I, I listened carefully to some of the comments that were made by Mr. Pickrow, Mr. Conrad, and Mr. Blum. And I think keying off that, it's really important that we go further from the realm of could to the realm of should uh, in our actions. And so I, I would suggest um, that, uh, that we include the stakeholders in shaping the recommendations. I listened to the process that went on and it was um, one where we uh, listen to our service providers and stakeholders, but they weren't part of shaping the solution. And our 60 plus community hasn't been engaged except through this meeting. So the, uh, I, 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 I think the idea of having um, a stronger community outreach effort, including workshops and culminating in a detailed document of how we will serve our 60 plus community, where we make the step from, you know, what we could do to actually prioritizing the needs and solutions, um, eliminating some fragmented services and developing some coalitions of regional and service uh, community providers um, so that we can adequately fund uh, on a sustainable basis, our 60 plus community services. Um, so, you know, keying off of these ideas, I think we need to uh, put some more meat on the bones of them, understand the value of each idea and um, what level of effort it would take to implement them. And most importantly, how they would fit together into a cohesive plan that has timing and funding requirements. Now we could add a branch to that, which is to identify some short-term improvements that we fund immediately with ARPA uh, while we are developing this longer term plan. And I think that might be a path um, forward. Um, the distinction that I would make is if you if you think about the process that we've taken um, by engaging and asking the CHSSC uh, to drive this, um, it it was a very valuable exercise. But the actual service providers, um, the Chamber of Commerce, the service clubs, and senior leaders in our community are not necessarily part of that. So. I, I look at this as almost an analog to what we've done with our general plan, where we have a general plan committee, and then we have an ad hoc committee that includes uh, this, this extended group where we could do uh, workshops with a larger number of people and actually drive toward some decisions uh, in that context. So um, when I'm thinking about how to move this forward, I'm thinking, let's you know, take this as a foundation of what we could do, but then charter an effort with an expanded group that would include all of the members of the CHSSC, but also include some additional stakeholders and service providers uh, to take it to the next level. Um, you know, I, I, I really can't find anything in the report uh, that I would disagree with it's a matter of taking it to the next level of what we 
what we will do as a town to serve this important need. And so that's, that's the way I'm thinking about um, the work that I've seen so far. Thank you. Vice Mayor Rennie. Um, so Council Member Hewitt has kind of detailed, a, a very detailed plan for a long-term solution. I, I guess that sounds fine. I'm trying to think how do we get jump-started short-term, which he did mention also. Um, and it, you know, I'm still hearing, I think, that more work needs to be done for the short term also. And so maybe the first task and that maybe you send back to the CH um, SSC um, is what is, what's the short term solution? Um, and I think you need to narrow the variables a little bit, um, certainly starting with budget. If, you know, I, um, I would still leave it open whether you, which, what service providers you want to use and so forth. Um, but I, again, I'm suggesting, you know, the 400 or 500,000 of, of ARPA funds, and we should probably have some, you know, and so you give them a, a budget and then we, when they know what the budget is, then it's a lot easier, I think, to start narrowing in what are the best ways or, or you know, give us a couple options maybe of, of how it, it should be spent. But then there's the CIP portion of it also because there, you know, there is the facilities that we're starting to do some work on. Um, but, uh, you know, even, even the, the REC, uh, LGS REC proposal had um, a few, had a few uh, facility um, renovation ideas, you know, like a new hardwood, sprung hardwood floor sounds like a good idea. Um, better lighting, you know, I'm not sure how much all that costs. Do we know how much CIP budget we have available? Could the council give a budget direction tonight? Um, you know, I, I don't want to spend it all kind of thing, but, you know, if we have a million, maybe we want to spend 300,000. Um, if we only have 500,000, maybe we want to spend 200. I, I don't know what ballpark we are in and I don't know what ballpark all this stuff's going to cost either. And if I could um, recognize town manager Pervetti. Thank you. I'll start and director Morley, I'm sure we'll add on. Uh, as you know, um, the council identified some additional CIP resources that are currently unprogrammed. We were hoping to bring an item, probably the second meeting in August or so for further direction in terms of additional investments. Um, I'm, I don't, I'll leave it to Director Morley if it would be helpful to have CIP direction uh, tonight, but I think we wanted to have a more holistic discussion about the other CIP investment opportunities. And with that, I'll turn to Director Morley. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that was exactly uh, sort of the line that I was gonna take was that you know, we were hoping to have a, a holistic conversation uh, in August with the council so that you could weigh all of the priorities together and have them uh, to the extent that we have uh, costs all in one place and be able to consider it all at once. If, if there's areas that um, as council member or vice mayor Rennie has just done that, that are of interest to you, certainly putting those on, on a bigger list would be something that we can do. Um, we're also working through, um, through a, uh, a sort of a, um, consultant report on our ADA needs. So we'll have some dollars that we can fill in on that as well. And hopefully balance um, the, the, the CIP across the board. We also have heard that we'd like to see a little bit about um, sort of our capital maintenance versus our, um, you know, like to have some of the more, um, some, some more balance to the CIP. And so we'd like to put some measures in place so that you can see what that looks like uh, graphically when we have that discussion. Um, so, Mayor, if I could respond to that. Um, so, I, I realize staff's hesitancy to give me numbers, um, and I, I'm trying to um, give, some, you know, like I said, narrow it a little bit um, and give, you know, so that, you know, I assume we'd send it back to the commission to, to run off um, with it. And 
you know, so that's why I was trying to come up with, you know, if you have some idea, you can spend 50,000 or you can spend 150,000, you can spend 250,000. You, you, it comes up with very different lists of, of ways to Im improve. And I guess we're not ready to give that direction. Um, the, again, the, the ones listed from LGS Rec make a lot of sense and they don't look that expensive to me. You know, the new sprung hardwood floor and lights for the building, upgraded IT connection and the room divider for configurable space. Those don't seem like they should be outrageous. Um, so, uh, so I would say, you know, those are good things to think about, but I don't know what else maybe hasn't been thought about. It hasn't been talked about that thoroughly. Um, let me uh, let me stop and see what other council members think at this point. Great. I see no hands raised, so I'll, I'll go ahead and share my thoughts. Um, you know, it, for me, whenever we embark on these discussions, I find it helpful to have some monetary ideas around how large we can we can go, um, because I think if we if we gave a wish list, um, I think we could all come up with some pretty big wish lists. And what I'd hate to do is then um, I'd want to manage expectations now, because I think what we're all concerned about is what are asking people their wish list and not being able to meet those expectations, just, I, I don't want that to happen. And so I think so, uh, giving us at least a general idea of what we're talking about, are we looking at in the 100,000, 200,000, you know, versus millions, versus tens of millions, I think that would be a good milestone. I agree that there's more discussion that has to happen. Um, uh, and so I'm really looking to staff and, and the commission on how do we bring those more detailed conversations back? And is it more useful to have that monetary amount so that um, it gives a guiding post to our members of our public? So that, those are my um, comments. And so I see Director Morley, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so ha having a list of sort of want to haves is, is always good and we can uh, start with that and we can work on costs or, or ballpark costs uh, from that respect. And that's generally how we uh, establish or build um, the CIP. So our unfunded needs list is things that we've identified over time. We start to put um, really rough, rough costs associated with them and then that helps them to climb or fall on the list a little bit depending on the cost for the, for the individual element. So. Uh, from a CIP perspective, if, if uh, we want to work with uh, with the commission to establish a list of their priorities or with a combination of stakeholders to establish a list of priorities, we can certainly uh, participate in that. I'd also point out that we do have a project to do a new floor in the senior center uh, that we're about to to get underway with. It's not a it's not a sprung dance floor. It's, it's more of a floor that's intended for a sort of an auditorium use. Um, so there, there, are, there is some work that is being done in that in that facility currently. And, and on the operating side, as what's been discussed, if folks were inclined to give a range of ARPA funds, then that would give staff, you know, a better understanding as we go back to the Community Health and Senior Service Commission, kind of what their range of options might be. And then once again, it would also give us the ability based on what they choose to make sure it meets eligible uses under ARPA. And, and mayor to the vice mayor's earlier question, we estimate approximately 1.6 million of unprogrammed CIP dollars. So if that helps in the conversation, thank you. And then, and then obviously if the town were to pursue a longer range goal of either a new facility or a significantly upgraded facility, that's a, a very different conversation too. That would either require bond funding or some type of revenue measure. And that's a much longer uh, detailed conversation. Thank you. Council Member Hudis. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, the mayor's direction or uh, suggestion that we put some financial boundaries on the next step here. As a thought, um, I would, I, in my mind, I think um, uh, somewhere around half a million dollars 
of that could be implemented within the next 12 to 15 months um, would be a reasonable boundary to put on those efforts. And then I think anything beyond that, we need to put in, in into sort of a, a comprehensive view um, where we look at the trade-off of you know various other options that are on that list. I was trying to put dollar figures next to even the short terms, and it, I was coming up with some very large numbers um, just there. And we know that we have to uh, kind of dig ourselves out of a hole that has uh, developed here. So I would think of it that way. Let's put a boundary um, of time and money on what we're um, asking the uh, commission to go and wrestle with. And then let's take everything else and wrap that into a more strategic plan that includes workshops and outreach and service providers and some of those other things that, that, uh, that others have mentioned. Now, I know, um, yes, Vice Mayor Rennie. Um, why don't we just put a motion on this? Um, and I believe um, Council Member Hudis was talking about spending versus um, CIP. Um, so let's give the let's give the direction, um, ask the commission to go um, figure out for, um, I think he said over the next year, um, how we could implement up to 500,000 um, to uh, make a much more robust senior program. Um, and that's a motion. And do I have a second? Council Member Hudis? I'll second. Okay. Any questions to the motion or comments? Yes, Mike, uh, Town Manager Provetti? I just want to clarify that the intention is to use ARPA funds if it is determined to be an eligible use. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And seeing no questions or comments, I'll call the question. Council Member Hudis? Aye. Vice Mayor Rennie? Aye. Council Member Badami? Aye. I also vote aye. And so the motion passes unanimously. And I think uh, many have already shared thanks to the commission for the accelerated work. So thank you, commission. Thank you, staff. And we look forward to the next steps. And I'll work with town manager Provetti on, on how that comes back to the council. And council member Hudis, do you still have a comment? Um, actually, I wanted to um, offer another um, attempt to deal with a longer term part of this because I think a lot of the work that has been done uh, has taken us way beyond where we were when we established this as a strategic priority, um, but it, the, the work is still ahead of us. So I, I'll just turn it into a motion uh, to establish an ad hoc uh, committee that would include all of the CHSSC plus uh, other uh, members of the community, including service providers, the Chamber of Commerce, representative service clubs, and senior leaders in the community, and expanding that to include uh, several council members, um, and uh, with the task of developing a roadmap uh, through community outreach activities, including workshops, that would culminate in a detailed document um, of how we would serve our 60 plus community, identifying and prioritizing needs and solutions, eliminating fragmented services, uh, developing coalitions of regional and community service for mutual benefit and adequately funding sustainable 60 plus community services. Um, this plan would include uh, the value of the ideas, the level of effort it would take to implement them, and importantly, how they would fit together into a cohesive plan with timing and funding requirements. So I, I don't wanna to get too detailed and write chapter and verse on it, but I wanted to give some idea what the, the outline or substance would be for this. 
And Vice Mayor, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I got um, a question for the, the town attorney on that one. I heard a couple things that I thought were legally incompatible. The word ad hoc and the entirety of a Brown Act committee um, is how does that work when they're talking about a subject that really includes their Brown Act <laughs> committee? We, we would treat this as a standing committee under the Brown Act and provide agendas and provide the public the ability to uh, participate in all of these meetings. So, so, so we would ask him to amend his motion, not to say ad hoc committee, but a, a standing sub, a standing committee. Correct. Okay. I would, I'll, I'll go ahead and second um, with, if that change is okay with the maker of the motion. Uh, that change is just fine. Um, I do have a quick question of staff um, before we begin understanding that um, I believe it's direct, uh, Mr. Andrews, you're the liaison on that. I, I am, and uh, it would be my pleasure. Well, I, I, my question just is understanding that um, there's only so many hours in a work day. Should this, should this, um, does this replace something? Do we need to prioritize? I just want to be mindful of what else is on everyone's plate. So from, a, from my workload perspective, uh, the Finance Commission with the budget process done is going to revert back to monthly meetings from almost uh, weekly or every other week. With this initial assessment being done, the Community Health and Senior Service Commission will revert back to monthly instead of almost every other week. Uh, so I, I should have bandwidth depending on, you know, the scheduling of this new subcommittee. Uh, I, I should have the bandwidth, you know, for the next several months. And Manager Provetti? I just wanted to add that, you know, we, we have a short-term motion that was already adopted uh, to come back to council with various options as to how, what in the short term we could do with about a half a million dollars. So that'll be probably priority number one for the CHSS. And then secondarily, then we would work towards the longer term plan. Um, and one um, suggestion that I have, uh, and this could be a separate motion or included in this motion, is that we come back to council with a recommended stakeholder list to um, in, in the form of a resolution similar to what we did for the general plan advisory committee. So that way we have, we know who the known stakeholders and representatives that will be joining the CHSS. And particularly if we're gonna have more than one council member, I, I think the council would, would want to um, make, the, make the appointment of no more than two council members. Um, so, so that's a suggestion that we don't have to decide tonight who those stakeholders would be, um, but that might also provide an opportunity to uh, to see who might be interested in, in joining us and then coming back and to establish just, that group. And just to follow up on the town manager's comments, so the next CHSSC meeting is June 22nd. They will also meet again in July. They traditionally take August off. So we will have two meetings to start debriefing the direction from council tonight. And so ideally we would come back uh, when council returns in, in August, if we can conclude it in two meetings, if not September. Okay, thank you both. Uh, any other questions to the motion? Council member Hudis? Um, no, I think it would be productive to perhaps amend the motion to uh, include the comments that Ms. Pavetti uh, made about providing a list of stakeholders as part of the resolution. Um, I think that would be helpful. So I'd like to make that amendment. Okay, and Vice Mayor, a seconder? Yep, that, I, that's okay with me. Okay, and any other questions or comments to the motion? Okay, let's call it. Uh, Council Member Hudis? Aye. Council Member Badami? Aye. Vice Mayor Rennie? Aye. I vote aye as well. And thank um, all that have uh, contributed their time to jumpstart this discussion. Um, as we've said, it's been a valuable discussion and we look forward to the continuation. We, um, I'm going to ask that we take a five minute break. Let's come back at 925 and then we'll continue with the remaining items. Thank you.
Welcome everyone and thank you for coming back. Um, we now move to agenda item 21, which is to accept the report and authorize the temporary installation of traffic homing devices for Shannon Road between Los Gatos Boulevard and Short Road. Um, yes. Um, Mr. Kim, welcome. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council members. Uh, Ujay Kim, the town engineer. I'll provide a quick uh, verbal report on this uh, item. The uh, town's neighborhood traffic calming policy was first adopted in, uh, by Council in 2006, which provided guidelines on implementing traffic calming measures on local streets, neighborhood collectors, and hillside collectors. Since 2006, 15 traffic calming projects have been successfully completed which equates to about one project each year. The uh, traffic calming measures commonly used in the past projects include speed humps, median island signage, and striping. Uh, for Shannon Road between Los Gatos Boulevard and Short Road, the town received petitions from the residents in 2019. Um, the Shannon Road is a neighborhood collector uh, within those project limits and is also a safe route to school. The speed limit posted there is 30 miles per hour. Uh, and soon after the petition were received, uh, staff conducted speed surveys and discovered that that 85th percentile of speeds averaged over 36 miles per hour, which warranted um, this, uh, the traffic calming project. Two neighborhood meetings were hosted for the project. Uh, first one was in November last year, and the second one was uh, on April 22nd this year. At the first meeting, um, uh, staff, uh, after the first meeting actually, staff designed a plan to install five speed humps along Shannon Road, approximately 400 to 500 uh, feet apart. The plan is based on a proposal plan um, that is uh, in the 2016 Los Gatos Safe Routes to School Phase One report um, uh, as well. The, uh, at the second meeting, a large majority of the residents on Shannon supported the speed humps. A uh, few members raised concerns regarding the uh, speed humps proposed, pointing out potential delays to um, emergency services and uh, commute traffic. Uh, staff confirmed with the county fire and the police department that the emergency services would not be affected by the speed humps if installed. Uh, after the second meeting, uh, staff mailed out 73 ballots to residents on Shannon Road. 54 ballots were received uh, with 48 ballots in favor of the speed humps, uh, which well exceeds the two third majority needed uh, to move forward. Uh, staff is seeking um, council's approval tonight for the pilot installation of the five speed humps. Uh, once the speed humps are in installed, staff, staff will continue to monitor the vehicular speeds, um, then reach out to the Shannon Road residents again uh, to um, get a final vote on making those, uh, making the traffic calming measure permanent, the speed humps. Uh, staff then would return to town council for the final approval as well. Uh, that concludes my verbal report and uh, I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Questions of Mr. Kim? Okay, seeing none, we'll open public testimony. And at this time, I see Terry Kent. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, welcome. Thank you very much. My name is Terry Kent. I've lived on Hilo Court in Los Gatos for more than 20 years. I want to express my opposition to the proposed installation of five speed humps and the 12 corresponding signs on Shannon Road. I, like residents of 15 other streets, must use Shannon Road multiple times every day to travel to key services and businesses throughout Los Gatos. I believe that five speed humps would be excessive and annoying, and also the 12 proposed signs would be ugly and an eyesore on a community neighborhood street. 
I encourage the town to try other measures first. For example, you could reduce the speed limit to 25 miles per hour, just like is posted on Los Gatos Boulevard. You could also post a digital speed sign like the one that's installed in front of the Terraces Assisted Living Center on Blossom Hill. It encourages um, cars to slow down. It indicates the speed that they are going and it reminds you to follow the speed limit. <laughs> also, another measure would just be placing law enforcement along Shannon Road to enforce the speed limit for a duration of time. Um, I was very disappointed that residents of 15 streets did not have the opportunity to vote on a change to our neighborhood. As mentioned this evening, it's very important to include stakeholders to shape the solution. I urge you to postpone the installation of the humps and try other traffic calming strategies first. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this subject? Frank? Uh, yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, I actually live on Shannon Road itself, um, close to the junction with the Short Road. Um, my house overlooks the road directly. It is very, very evident. Every day we have excessive speeding on Shannon Road. Um, it comprises, I would say, a combination of uh, violations perpetrated by young drivers, perhaps with their first cars, high-powered uh, sports cars, um, and it occurs many, many times per day. Um, the point uh, about uh, attempting uh, other options have been discussed. Uh, we have had multiple meetings with uh, the neighborhood, uh, and with the uh, Parks and Public Works Department. The problem of speeding on Shannon Road is not occasioned by people not knowing what the speed limit is. It is caused because the road actually invites speeding. We have a relatively long, straight section of road between Short Road and Blossom Hill Park. People are speeding because they can and because they want to. Nobody's speeding because they don't know what speed they're doing. They're speeding because they want to and the road invites it. Uh, we have had discussions regarding uh, using the police uh, services to enforce the speed limit. And we were advised that because of manpower restrictions, that is not a valid option um, for any period of time. So you might have a temporary effect, but it disappears as soon as the police uh, effectively goes away. Um, we have many pedestrians, elderly and very young, who use this road. Our neighbor across the street would refuse to cross the road in front of his own house because of the danger of uh, speeding traffic. Um, so we would like to see something which is self-enforcing and permanent. So on that basis, and with the votes cast by the residents uh, on Shannon Road, we would encourage the pr uh, proposal to go through. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? I see no other hands raised, so I'm going to close public testimony and bring it back to council for either questions of Mr. Kim, comments, and ultimately a motion for direction. Actually, I have a question of Mr. Kim. Mr. Kim, um, one of the speakers had mentioned um, 
some various options, including um, uh, law enforcement signage, the digital signage, and I can't remember what the first one was. Um, can you talk through the process that um, your department has in, in in recommending what option and why the speed bump? Uh, yes, uh, the different options were considered and discussed with the, uh, the neighborhood, um, the members of the neighborhood. Uh, we did consider digital um, signage, the speed radar. And um, as uh, Frank mentioned, uh, felt that it wouldn't be as effective as the speed homes. Um, enforcement is obviously uh, an option as well. Um, and the police department is aware of the situation and they've been involved throughout the neighborhood uh, meetings. Um, 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 and I'm, I'm sure they'll do whatever um, they can to um, increase the reinforcements needed. Um, enforcement's needed. Uh, as far as lowering the speed uh, limit, uh, we can't uh, technically uh, warrant a lowering of the speeds with the current survey of the speeds that we took, um, um, which would not uh, legally um, stand on a court if, if challenged. And so um, with the survey with 85 percentile of speeds coming in at over 35, uh, we can't just arbitrarily reduce the speed to 25. That's not something that we, it's not, we're not allowed to do. So. Those are the reasons. And, um, and also uh, for the safe routes to school, um, there was a consideration of doing some speed tables, which are the wide speed homes. Um, they, they would also slow down the speeds, but not as much as the speed homes. So uh, these are all the options that we considered. And the, um, the traffic engineer is here in attendance as well. And we'll be able to answer more questions if you have. But um, those were the, the design and thought process that uh, went through with the current recommendation. Okay, and I appreciate that. I just wanted to um, uh, just to better understand the process. So thank you. Council Member Hudis. Uh, thank you, just a point of clarification. Um, I've heard the term speed bump and I've heard the term speed hump uh, in the report. Could you clarify and is there any effective difference between those? Um, it, there isn't probably um, a difference. Uh, it, it's, it could probably be used interchangeably, but speed humps are probably more of a standard term for a traffic calming measure. Um, yeah, you might see a speed bump uh, on, a, on a parking lot, um, but um, the detail and the cross-section of those would be similar, um, but we have a, a town standard that we would apply for a speed hump. Um, the, the major difference we will come in with the speed table, which would be a wider 10 foot wide uh, table that would be installed. Uh, so that, that's where the distinction would happen. I see. And we're not recommending a table here. Is that correct? Um, um, that's not what the, uh, the neighborhood voted for. They voted for the speed humps. Um, so yeah, that's the current recommendation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Vadami. With the analysis and the survey that was done, uh, what is proposed before us is clearly the most effective solution. So I'm just gonna jump in and make a motion. But I move to accept the report and authorize the temporary installation of traffic calming devices for Shannon Road between Las Gatas Boulevard and Short Road. Thank you and may I have a second? Councilmember Hudis. Um, I'll second. Okay, any questions or comments to the motion? Seeing none, Council Member Hudis. Aye. Council Member Badami. Aye. Vice Mayor Rennie. Aye. I also vote aye and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And we now move to item number 22 which is to provide direction on the proposal from Forbes Mill LLC requesting a restaurant pop-up at Forbes Mill located at 75 Church Street on Saturdays from June 19th through October 30. Welcome, Monica. Good to see Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Monica Wren, the Economic Vitality Manager, and before you this evening um, is the proposal that the Mayor just outlined. Um, 
And I'm gonna keep my comments brief. I realize it's getting late, but I do want you um, to know that we're all here to answer your questions. We're just looking for some guidance on um, an existing restaurant who's looking to do a pop-up in this location. It's property owned by the town and the restaurant use is one of the outlined use, it, uses in the lease, which was attached to the staff report. Um, and so it gives us the opportunity to try that, that use here. We've received some public comments that were also attached. And if you have any questions on any of the documentation, we're happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. Council members, any initial questions before public testimony? Yes, Vice Mayor Rennie. Um, so I was trying to understand the restaurant use. It, it looked like it's outside, um, kind of on the trail side of the building. Is this meant to be a, a basically or mostly for people that are, are using the trail? I definitely think that there's a combination based on the proposal and some subsequent conversation. Um, I think that there's an opportunity to draw folks off of the trail and folks off of the street, both walking, driving, biking. So it, it provides us an opportunity to really have a multimodal access for a gathering spot for visitors and residents alike. And, and I so when I thought it was mostly about trail, then I started wondering why it was going to be open till nine o'clock at night and, and whether that's, uh, you know, really necessary to have it open that late? I think it's definitely the purview of the council if, if you're looking at different hours. Um, I, my thought and what I understand is that there's um, a thought to kind of try a breakfast crowd, a lunch crowd, a dinner crowd, see how that traffic flows, see how it fits with the neighborhood. Um, it gives the ability to have some flex as I understand it, um, it wouldn't be the full 12 hours right out of the gate. It would be kind of an opportunity to just to try some things out. Um, dinner service is typically done, you know, seven or eight o'clock at night, usually the last round. So I think that was the thought behind the nine o'clock. Um, but I, I do believe that Mr. Foley's in the audience today to have that to do some public comment. He may be able to be more specific with the answers on that. And and. To follow up on that, you know, I can imagine, you know, again, breakfast or lunch being people that are on the trail, dinner starts to get into everybody's got to drive there and there isn't that many parking spaces. So I'm trying to understand if that, you know, how, how big a restaurant for evening are we talking about? Is there enough parking available for that? Yeah, and I think part of the benefit of it being in the summer is that it's lighter later. So um, there could still be the ability to use the trail or use the streets and walk, you know, Main Street down. Um, I think it just depends on, on the customer and the product. And one final last question. Um, so this is a pop-up that implies we're testing to see if a restaurant works here. Um, is it, but everything is outside. So are we testing for a restaurant that would then be like this outside or are we testing for a restaurant that would be inside? I think it could be both. The, the inside will be open for the restroom use. Um, I think because it's a pop-up in nature, we often see this in the commercial world with vacancies. Um, they will, um, a, a landlord will put somebody in who can kind of utilize the space in a way that's not really disruptive to the shell itself without doing TIs, without making major changes. And given the licensing that this particular restaurant has, it makes sense to, to use the outside area. They're not disrupting anything on the inside. And then that way it's still available for a variety of tenants. Whereas if they went through TIs, it doesn't make sense to be a pop-up or if they did major changes on the inside, then perhaps it's not as welcoming to another use through this leasing process. So I think the ability to use the outdoors, but have the indoors open offers the chance to see the space function and maybe identify challenges or identify what could potentially work there in the future. Okay. Thank you. Council member Badami. A couple questions. Um, I'm trying to understand the draw from street traffic because it, so off the beaten path um, that it's really not visible to most people that even would, would know it's there to even drive there, you know, unless there's some type of publicity that's going on. But with that in mind, um, is it just beer and wine or the opportunity to serve cocktails? And with cocktails, will there be cocktails to go, which could present a problem? 
And then a direct question would be, what would be considered the occupancy since it's primarily outside? How do we know what, how big of a crowd we could get and how many picnic tables? Um, because it's, it's really a secluded um, area. Sure. So it's my understanding that it's beer and wine, but I don't know that for sure. That could be a question that we could clarify with uh, Mr. Foley when we have a conversation with him. The council could also put parameters around it if there's if there is a desire to go one way or the other. Um, as far as cocktails or beer or wine to go, that's really going to be dependent upon what the ABC comes out with. As I understand it right now, they're anticipating keeping that ability um, through the end of this calendar year. Um, but I just don't know that could potentially change. Um, and I'm sorry, I think you had a two part question and I didn't answer the first part. Can you repeat it? Uh, I was asking about the post occupancy when it's outdoors. So it's almost like anything goes with the picnic tables. I, I think I saw five in a diagram, but it's sure. Not so we could, we, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> we could definitely um, put some some parameters around that that we ask, you know, for for fire occupancy or whatever that occupancy load would be. Um, it would be the expectation that 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 area is operated in a safe and functional manner as it would if it was a long term lease. So we would definitely be looking for safety measures in place that it's not overpopulated or overcrowded. Thank you. Of course. And I, my, I have a question before we go to public testimony. I know um, in the staff report, it states that it is a, the restaurant use is a permitted use under our current agreement. And so this pop-up does test it. So my question is, if it doesn't work, do we have an ability then to amend the lease so that that restaurant provision would be struck? I'm gonna let Mr. Schultz take this question. So we, we wouldn't need to strike the provision if the restaurant doesn't work. I mean, the, the message would be sent to the lessee that we're not looking for a restaurant. And again, you're still going to have final say uh, at the end of the day for any use that goes in there. Um, the good thing about a pilot program is that you do get the ability to see how it will work at this location and then make that determination. But I don't think we'd actually need to amend the lease. We could, but um, certainly since we already have the ability at the end of the day to allow for any permanent use that goes in there, um, we would just work with the, with the lessee to make certain that if in fact, at the end of this pilot program, if it's not suitable with the neighborhood, we would instruct the lessee to look for other tenants besides the restaurant. Councilmember Vidami. Mr. Schultz, would that mean that we would always have a say in whatever new restaurant might go in there if it was approved? And let's say a restaurant went in there and it was great, but maybe they decided to fold up after three or four months. And then another restaurant comes in that didn't operate very well, that caused a lot of problems, but now we've already approved restaurant use. So do we have a say with each and every restaurant if we approve a restaurant that might go in? You actually do in this situation. That's what's remarkable about this situation in Tate Street is that you're not just granting the, a use, a conditional use permit, but you are the landlord for this property. So at any time, yes, you could remove a tenant if they were not uh, within your, your parameters and liking. So that is still possible. We have tremendous power to decide who goes in there and how long they would be able to stay in there as opposed to granting a conditional use permit that runs with the land. Thank you. And we, specific, we specifically talk about no assignments. So even if it was going to be assigned, it would have to come back to you as a new restaurant, which typically does not happen in a, in a usual conditional use permit where you're not the owner of the property. Any other questions? Seeing none, I will open public testimony. At this time, I see two hands raised, but if anyone would like to speak on this, please raise your hand. First speaker is Greg Hacker. Good evening. Uh, I am the current president uh, on the board of directors for Forbes Mill Homeowners Association. And I wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. 
and I'm very impressed that it looks like all the town council members uh, have read very closely uh, the proposal that was sent to you, and I certainly hope that you had enough time to read our letter of opposition. The first thing I did want to mention is that we here at Forbes Mill Condominiums were actually totally unaware of the details contained within the master lease document, document that was executed uh, between the town and Forbes Mill LLC uh, and did not realize the content until we received a copy in tonight's application. Uh, with that being said, I realize that we are not actually a party to this agreement and, and of course uh, have no legal hearsay, so to speak, but uh, in the past, since the museum shut down, we have been verbally assured in the past that we would be included in the loop and kept fully informed regarding any matters relating to the Forbes uh, Mill Annex building. Uh, with that being said, it has been pointed out by several of you already that under that section 1.12 of the master lease uh, regarding permitted uses, it does make reference to the potential for residential, office, retail, restaurant, and other services approved by the master tenant in town. Uh, bottom line is that uh, the board of directors here pretty much has come to the conclusion that we believe the use as a restaurant is going to be the least desirable choice, uh, pretty much having to do with the fact that we feel that would overburden the road easement uh, due to deliveries, but food trucks, uh, food and supplies on what you probably already know is a very narrow and curving driveway, uh, plus the insufficient amount of parking spaces has already been brought up by vice mayor and we agree with that and we honestly feel that a restaurant type use uh, could pretty much generate excessive noise and uh, pretty much eliminate the uh, the right of our 48 families to continue to use and enjoy our property in a quiet and peaceful manner. So therefore, we respectively request that the town council deny this proposed use. Thank you very much. Mr. Hacker, the next speaker is Joe's Galaxy. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, you can, welcome. Good evening, council. Just like to present a couple of technical points that you might take into your deliberation as you decide this issue. My name is Joe Hargett. I'm a resident of 95 Church Street in Los Gatos. I'm speaking tonight to express my concern about the long-term use, the long-term use, not the interim use, of the annex as a restaurant. First, I'd like to mention that the only access to the annex is by way of a private drive that services Forbes Mill residents. The driveway, as some of you probably already know, is approximately 120 feet in length with a grade slope of between 15 and 20 degrees. There is a pinch point at the bottom of the drive where when entering the property, vehicles must make a 90 degree left-hand turn. Large to mid-sized delivery trucks require heavy braking as they descend the driveway and then strain to reach the top as they exit. The noises associated with this type of traffic will be disruptive to six families that have bedrooms, patios, or balconies with just in a few feet of the driveway. For many years, the public use of the annex has been limited to daytime business hours and an occasional weekend. Restaurant use would add evenings and weekends to those hours, increasing vehicular traffic twofold. Restaurants support traffic such as delivery trucks, service vehicles, and staff vehicles, in addition to diners, will compete with pedestrians and bicycle traffic, much of which uses the roadway and not the sidewalks. This is especially true on weekends. As an owner operator of three restaurants in Los Gatos over many years, I'm familiar with the logistics and pitfalls of efficiently operating a small restaurant. If because of the isolation of the annex, operators struggle to survive, the building could become a revolving door of restaurants. If a restaurant were a success, 
the burden to Forbes Mill homeowners will be compounded. Product delivery could begin as early as 6 a.m. Traffic would increase beyond the limits of roadway original design. Parking would be a constant enforcement problem. The build out of restaurant compared to typical retail office use is far more intensive and disruptive. These are problems that could easily overwhelm the intended use of Forbes Mill property as a residential community. As residents, we are anxious to partner with Forbes Mill LLC and contribute in any way possible toward a win-win relationship. We welcome a neighbor who will occupy the annex in a way that is harmonious with the peaceful use and enjoyment of our home. And I just have to add to council, I applaud you for the grace with which you tolerate some very, very repugnant content, uh, comments this evening. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jim Foley. Good evening, Madam Mayor and uh, Honorable Council. Can you hear me? We can, welcome. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of a different format here because I guess there's not really an application. Um, it's based on this lease that, uh, that we have that you're familiar with. Um, I, I hear some of these questions and concerns. Uh, I want to thank you know, both of the previous speakers, Greg and Joe. We, we've been in contact with them. The way that this came together was really accelerated in, in the last week or two um, in order to try to get it in front of uh, town council before um, the meeting break and, and on the schedule. And so we haven't had uh, enough time, I think, to work out some of the details and the concerns that they've raised. Um, I'm pretty confident that we can. Um, and I would look forward to, to working with them to try to see, you know, what types of things we can do, whether it's hours of operation, uh, deliveries, noise, all of those things, in my mind, are things that we can mitigate. I think that, um, you know, as far as what we're, where we're headed in the direction that we're taking the project, we're still fully marketing Forbes Mill uh, to a number of different uses, including office and retail. And we still think ultimately um, that could be what is located there. But as we became more familiar with the property and the project, we, we are understanding this outdoor area and we just feel that it has a really unique potential to do something that's food related. Um, maybe it becomes the primary use, maybe it becomes in conjunction with another use. Um, maybe it's all indoor, maybe it's outdoor. It could be a lot of different things. And this is just kind of our, you know, dipping our toe in the pool, so to speak, to kind of see how it could work. Um, and we want to make sure that everybody's very clear, you know, us as the, the subtenant uh, under the master lease with the town, us as a good neighbor to the Forbes Mill Condominium Association, we're, we're not trying to be, you know, we're not trying to bring any kind of adverse use or project. Anything that we do, we want to make sure people are comfortable with. Um, we look at this as potentially being an, an amenity, not a nuisance, if we can execute it right and hope that the homeowners would feel the same way. Um, some of the specific questions regarding parking and use, uh, you know, we, we have brought up in the past and just most recently haven't closed the loop, but have brought up in the past the potential to um, enter into some kind of an agreement with the association, you know, maybe to lease some of the parking or compensate them for, um, you know, whatever intensification might occur on the roadway to make sure that, you know, we're not um, damaging them in any way. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here for questions if you have questions about it, but really we just want to want a chance to try this out and see how it works and then, you know, get back to council on both ends, uh, you know, both of us hopefully together, you know, reporting back whether it's, you know, something that we think is going to be a good thing for the future or not. Um, and I'm here for, for more questions if you have them. Vice Mayor, um, you do have a question, Ray, so Mr. Foley, if you could stay on the line. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Foley, the first question that comes to mind is there is so little parking there. And in Los Gatos, we have a lot of problems with controlling our employees and where they, they park. Um, would you be able to get <laughs> keep the employees from parking, um, taking up the parking that is available for this building or taking up parking that was is um, supposed to be for the residents in that area? Sure. So it's a good question. You know, I'm excited about all the steps that the town's taking with the employee parking program and everything else. A um, couple things to, I guess, to 
to distinguish here is sort of the this interim proposed use versus a long-term use, right? So for the, the interim use here, I think staff is going to be very light. You know, I don't anticipate there being more than like four or five uh, people maximum. Um, and so I think, you know, if you look at the worst case scenario, how many cars is that? Something that I've thought about is the ability for the employees to park um, off Miles Avenue in the in the unlimited lot and be able to walk over, the, potentially walk over the bridge to get down here, the footbridge from behind Old Town. Um, that doesn't seem like that would be out of the question. But also, you know, there's we can't we can't rely on all the additional parking, but we'd still be very interested in discussing some sort of an agreement uh, with the Forbes Association to make, they have a lot of additional unused parking that, um, you know, I think in the past have been a problem with vagrants and things and it's gated off at this time. Uh, but when we, when we bring, you know, occupancy to the area, uh, our thought would be, you know, maybe we can come to an agreement if we need to, to use that overflow parking. And we don't know, it's a question um, as to how, you know, how much vehicular traffic there's gonna be. I think what's really, something that we're really interested in is capturing the trail users. And I've seen this, uh, this something like this was successful in Incline Village where there was a, a widely used um, bike trail called Tunnel Creek and Tunnel Creek then had like a pop-up restaurant and then it, it you know, became very successful and it worked really well. Um, it's not, I think there is in proximity to some residential, but it's not as close as um, our neighbors at the Forbes Mill Association. Uh, but I think that's the goal is to try to capture a lot of the trail users and, you know, we'll have to see whether or not that also translates into a bunch of additional vehicular traffic requiring parking. Um, long answer to your short question is I think that we can manage the employees to not, um, have an impact. And then the unknown will be the customers and who we're really drawing from. Um, second question on, on, I had a comment on Tunnel Creek. So it was so successful. They then built the East Lake trail to add on to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe, maybe so. I think that's, that was under, uh, definitely under, a um, a separate project that had been in the works for quite a long time. But, um, so back, back to this, um, it is, so the one thing I, I haven't been over there for a little bit, isn't there a lot of road noise there? Is that as outdoor really going to work? Yeah. I mean, again, that's up to us to test out. So there is, there is a free, a, they're very, you know, loud freeway noise. And so again, this is, there's the short term and the long term, you know, with not a lot of investment with our partnership with the Oak and Rye and what they have, um, it's very easy to kind of test it out and see if this becomes appealing or not. Uh, you know, a lot of these things are, are very speculative. Well, how much, how much of an impact is it going to have? We don't really know. Well, I think town attorney pointed out, you know, there's, there's a lot of control here by the town to make sure we're not damaging anybody in any way. And as far as, you know, what, what people are going to enjoy or not enjoy, I don't really want to speculate on that. We think that we can execute it in a way that's going to be, you know, a good neighbor to our neighbors and, you know, present a unique opportunity for customers to, you know, sit down outside and, um, you know, the long-term answer may be that there have to be improvements done there in, in the outdoor patio area to mitigate, you know, some of that freeway noise. Uh, we don't really know, or maybe it just come become something different entirely, but I think for not a lot of overhead or, or tenant improvement investment, we have, you know, a really a neat way to kind of test the waters and see, okay, what is appealing or, you know, maybe over the course of the summer and early fall, um, we change things and try to figure out how we can make it more appealing if it's not immediately appealing to the customers. Um, so again, like the pilot program test case scenario, we're fortunate to, you know, if you guys are, if you as the council are able to um, work with us on that, then I think uh, it's a, a unique way for us to be able to test it out. Thank you. I'll give um, Council Member Hudis a chance. Council Member Hudis. Thanks. I had a couple of sort of operational questions, then I had a more strategic one. Let me start with the operational. Um, is it uh, possible to limit the uh, deliveries so that they do not go down the driveway? Um, yeah, again, this is, I guess it goes to, um, 
it goes to the short term versus the long term again. So what we're really talking about doing, and I know that this is a question uh, that the association had, is we're talking about bringing a food trailer in on Saturdays. And I have every intention also of meeting again with the association and discussing these hours and making sure they're comfortable with what we're trying to do. But when we bring the trailer in, it already has all of the products in it. So that's going to be different than what would happen if we were to build a, you know, in another, another kind of food use there down the line. So there might be more of a conversation at that time, um, you know, and maybe, maybe just bringing in the food trailer kind of gives an idea of what noise might be like at certain hours that we could, you know, then sort of translate into what kind of limitations would be appropriate for a more permanent use. Um, but there, you know, we won't know that, I guess, yet as to the deliveries because it's really coming preloaded and then exiting, you know, after having done all the kind of cleanup and janitorial things that we're going to need to do at the end of every Saturday. Um, it'll be basically, you know, packed, packed up, packed trash and, and hauled out. Well, I guess, would it be feasible to uh, have a restriction so that uh, trucks would not be making deliveries of the, the uh, materials would be carried on hand trucks down the driveway. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I guess I'm confused. So short term on the pop-up, that isn't going to be, there won't be any deliveries. Right. We wouldn't have the need for that long term. If we're talking about, you know, a more permanent use. I mean, I think what I envision there is I envision coming back either with, um, you know, this, this pop-up tenant or a, a subsequent one or something having worked out all of these details with Forbes Mill Association to their satisfaction. So whether that's, you know, uh, restrictions on deliveries, whether they're time or how, or how they're made um, or other things that they, you know, they, they need, we need to be a good neighbor and they need to, you know, we, we, it's our job to convince them that we think that this can be a good thing for them. And that's what we're going to do. So on the okay. long term, we, we've got a long ways to go before we can get into those details. Okay. And, and um, have you given, given consideration to reduced hours or reduced days of operation? Sure. Again, this goes to the fact that we pulled this together, you know, very quickly in the past couple of weeks and didn't have enough opportunity to work with them. But, you know, whatever, however we can proceed with the, uh, understanding that we'll go to them and talk to them about, you know, hours that they're more comfortable with or starting with certain hours or maybe, you know, on a certain day, trying different hours. We're totally open and flexible to whatever makes everybody feel the most comfortable. Okay, thank you. Mr. F uh, Council Member Badami. Thank you, Mr. Foley. I have a question for you. So does the food trailer already exist for Oak and Rye or that's something that you guys are going to rent for a while? Because I would hate to see an investment made on a temporary experimental basis that doesn't come to fruition. That could be a costly um, mistake. So is that something that already exists? Yeah, thank you for the question. I appreciate that and, and, and looking out for that because uh, none of us want to waste any money. It does exist already. They do have a food trailer that we are planning to use. Thank you. Mr. Foley, my question to you, um, I think you heard the conversation about the uh, permitted uses. Has, have you and your um, partners abandoned the idea of, of office and or retail? So that's the first question. And then second, if you can share how you will continue to market it during the summer when you have this pop up. Right, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, both very good questions. So no, we are still open and actively marketing it um, with flexible uses in mind, meaning office, retail, um, potentially food and there will be no impact really to the showing of the space when it comes to, you know, an office tenant needing to get in there for a tour. Remember, we're only doing this on Saturdays through the, through October. So typically our broker tours are in during the week. Um, and I think we can handle, you know, answers to any questions about the length or whether or not, 
you know, this pop-up would continue while also having an office tenant in there or not. And it would be, you know, just sort of conditions of, of whatever, you know, the market drives as far as, you know, what, what, let's say we got the perfect office tenant in three weeks. Um, you know, we'd probably, you know, potentially abandon the, the pop-up or if we had to go through a tenant improvement process, the pop-up could exist while we're, you know, permitting the, the renovations that are going to need to incur, occur to accommodate the new tenant. Um, so to answer that first part of your question, I think, you know, we, we've realized a unique opportunity that we've noticed in other places that seems relevant to this space building an outdoor area. So we're sort of kind of casting a wide net to see if maybe this additional idea of restaurant use might work, but, if not, or if just the market drives us back towards office space um, or something else, some other kind of use, then that's exactly what we're pursuing. And I think I think the last part of the question was, how are we continuing to market? I mean, we have a brokerage team that you might be familiar with that was intimately involved with this project when it began three years ago. Um, and they're still there and they're still you know retained on both museum properties to um, actively market for a breadth of uses. Um, and what I think, you know, might be helpful to understand is through the, the pandemic office use has been, you know, there hasn't been a lot of activity there. And so we're seeing more now. Um, but we want to make sure that we get a top notch tenant. And so we haven't eliminated the possibility of, you know, top notch, uh, you know, food users to look at it at the same time that, office users might be potentially looking at it um, and we'll, we'll see maybe, maybe a, a top notch restaurant tenant comes up in the midst of this pop-up that's different than Oak and Rye. And we have a conversation with them and Forbes association and you and the town council to discuss what that might look like. Um, or maybe a first class office tenant comes up through our marketing activities. So it's still very open. And this is just sort of a, an, an interim idea that could be really fun and interesting for Los Gatos and it could turn into something more or it could not. Thank you. Um, Council member Hughes. So I, I wanted to pursue that a, a little bit further. Um, th this uh, property is probably one of the most, if not the most historic structure in town. And it's, uh, it, you know, it needs to be preserved, but it also uh, could serve as a landmark for the town and could be part of sort of the town's iconic branding. Um, does this step lead us to that? Or is it sort of just a way to kind of keep commerce going and help our uh, businesses recover? Um, or is it in any way contributing to this to a long term uh, use of this that's the highest and best use? I mean, I think from from that standpoint, my, my position would be that a restaurant use there is far and away the best because then you're inviting the community in to be able to see the interior, you know, and visit the interior and exterior of one of the first buildings in Los Gatos, the first structures and an important part of history. Um, you may or may not know, you know, we've been in close contact with Numu about some of the artifacts that are remaining there in the hopes that they can be incorporated into the project. And while we have uh, the ability to invite people in with a use like that, if it becomes an office space, it is less likely for anyone to be able to go inside unless they're a specific client or customer of that business, which is, you know, far less than something that would be, you know, food related for, um, you know, I guess I would use the word more transient customers. Um, so, you know, I think that it's just really subject to working well with, with our neighbors there and being good neighbors. Um, and I think that, you know, we've seen, there's plenty of examples of, of ways that it can work well. Um, there are some things in, you know, in San Jose and other nearby communities that are in very close proximity to residential. And I think have experienced in the beginning, 
concern, but then as things operations move forward and they they're good neighbors with their neighbors, that things turn out to be not as bad as people think. And I'm sure there are plenty of bad examples of things that, you know, didn't go so well. So, you know, I think that's where the town has a lot of authority on how it goes. And, you know, us, you know, as a subtenant taking that direction from the town as to, you know, what we think is going to be good going forward. Um, so that's how I would view it as far as, you know, from a historical perspective, ha having the benefit of the community to enjoy it more would probably be something food related if we can make everybody comfortable with that. Well, I would just, you know, suggest that, that it, it might really take some thought and I, I hope you'd be able to respond to this. Mm -hmm. um, if that were the direction, uh, there are very major concerns raised by the residents um, in Forbes Mill. And it would seem to me, um, you, you know, I guess I'll put it into a question. Would you be willing to entertain some pretty, uh, I would call them unusual or radical ways of operating a restaurant to, uh, and potentially, you know, changing where customers park, how people access the building, uh, and things like that in order to uh, coexist with uh, these neighbors that are very concerned about it. Uh, it, might, it might be a good use in terms of preserving the building and inviting the community in, um, but it would seem to me, uh, I would just say, are you, are you open to some pretty um, creative ways to deal with the concerns that the neighbors are raising? Yeah, ab absolutely. Because I think at a certain point, it just becomes not feasible, right? So if it comes to the point where, okay, you can be open for two hours a day, one day a week, or, you know, then, then we're, we're basically getting the message that it's not going to work or we're impacting our neighbors too much. Um, I don't see that. I see some, you know, having a good logistical conversation with them to figure out a way that we can, you know, work within the framework that they're comfortable with. And, you know, again, it comes back to then if it doesn't work or we, or we are able to test it and we, and then there's, you know, meaningful objections that are documented about how they've been negatively impacted or whatever, then it's, it's over and we're going to have to move on and um, continue down the road with some other uses. So I think that it, that will be a natural, it will work itself out naturally with us taking the position that we are going to be good neighbors and we aren't going to create any impacts. And if we then do, we've, you know, we're not doing what we said we were going to do and it's going to preclude us moving forward. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Foley. Next speaker is Marilee Rimmer. Hi, um, I'm a resident of 55 Church Street, one of the buildings that uh, shares that driveway down to the annex. Um, I have a couple of concerns. Um, I think that the amount of traffic that could be generated would be very disruptive. And um, that in the long run creates a lot of problems. We do have the high school and the kids that use that uh, come across the bridge. And I drove down there today to see, you know, what, what it might be. And there were a couple of kids coming off the bridge and uh, turning and, and not even seeing my car just came right out in front of me off the path um, across the street and, you know, down behind the annex. So I'm really concerned about the kids and how they use it. The, High school kids up, um, you know, from the field hockey, come up um, out of there, and you know, if there if there's more traffic, um, bikes or cars or whatever it is, I think it's a real safety issue to have that kind of traffic that could support the restaurant. I'm intrigued by the idea, but um, I think the added noise, um, the garbage that might be there. Um, we know how 
the, the restaurants around here generate a lot of garbage. And I think, you know, with the encampment right around the corner, it's just going to create a even bigger problem of, you know, a mess down there. And um, so anyway, I'm definitely concerned about the added noise and, and disruptive nature that um, something like that could um, bring. And that would definitely impact all the residents around there. Um, I am concerned also about the parking because um, certainly we have faced many problems with um, the high school and events and things like that that they have and um, maintaining the parking places for the residents here rather than the high school. So I'm not sure how that's gonna be taken care of. Another issue, I guess, to work out. But anyway, those are my thoughts. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Schweitzer. Hi, can you hear me? We can, welcome. Hi there, uh, thank you for the time. Um, I'm also a resident of 95 Church Street, and um, I echo the sentiment of my uh, 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 prior residents uh, who spoke here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm mostly concerned about capacity. Um, you're coming in and out, you have one way in and the same way out. So if there were to be an emergency, you'd have people at the end of this drive trying to get out along with our residents. So that's the first uh, uh, concern I have. The second is, in the community, you know, this is the pathways we all know for children, um, our children in the community, my children, and um, others. And so, so um, as those children come down paths and other paths into a bar restaurant that's serving beer and wine, I, I'm concerned about the message that we're sending there. Um, I appreciate Mr. Foley's, um, I think, offer to, um, um, to take a look at what the possibilities are. Um, but I also heard, you know, several times the words potential, maybe pilot test, potentially abandoned. To me, that means um, he's unsure. Um, so at a minimum, I would suggest we pause. Let's get together and talk about what this could really be. And let's make sure this is good for the community. Uh, the evolving uh, um, restaurant business in Los Gatos, which I cherish immensely but make sure it's good for the 48 residents and over a hundred people that live here. Um, and those people do go to bed um, sometimes before nine and 1030 at night. And this would certainly disrupt that. Thank you for your time, council members. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next speaker, Lee Quintana. Hi, Council. Um, just a few comments. Uh, the idea of an outdoor restaurant at Forbes Mill is very enticing. Um, as a pop-up one day a week, it might work if various things could be worked out with the uh, Forbes Mill community. However, that's very different than looking at it as a pop-up to check whether it would work as a full-time indoor plus outdoor restaurant. Having a food truck move in and with all the food, et cetera, already there and go out with all the garbage, that's only two trips. But a full-time restaurant six or seven days a week will have much more garbage coming in and out, many more deliveries going in and out will have much more impact on the adjacent residents and will probably have the added noise of the kitchen ventilators, which can be very noisy and annoying. And I can attest to that because I live in a condo in Oregon, just above a restaurant and it is not pleasant sometimes. Um, it seems to me that yes, this would be the best use from a financial standpoint for both uh, commercial businesses and the town. However, I think it is not fleshed out well enough to even consider it as a short-term pop-up 
um, let alone as that being a test for whether it would be viable as a full-time restaurant. Please think about this very carefully. Once a decision is made, it is hard to turn around and say, no, it doesn't work. That's just the history of life. We make a decision and we don't want to necessarily admit it was the wrong one, so we just keep going with it. Um, please think about it very carefully. It's very enticing. I would love to sit there, probably maybe not with all the noise from the freeway, but um, please consider the neighbors as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Quintana. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? I see no other hands raised, so I will close public testimony bring it back to the council for further discussion, questions, and ultimately a motion. Uh, Vice Mayor Rennie. Um, so I guess I mind sort of a question for staff. Um, it seems to me like there hasn't been enough time um, for Mr. Foley to, to work this out. Um, you, the, the recommendation you have is provide direction. Can we provide some kind of direction that says, you know, we want Mr. Foley to work with Forbes Mill Association some more to see what, um, if there's parameters that would make this work? Is, is that a good enough direction? What, what more would there need to be? Um, I'll start and if, uh, Manager Pervetti has more to add than I would invite her comments. Um, you can certainly do that. You could certainly set up some parameters that would need to be agreed upon before the pop-up can start, or we can, um, you know, you can set whatever, whatever works for you. Um, you know, we could shorten the hours. We could do a couple of different things. We could try it and come back the very first meeting in August um, and then see if, if there's some feedback um, I know that it says that it would start on June 19th, but perhaps we push that start date out and allow a couple before August, you know, three or four, and then we do a check-in at the first meeting. So there, there's flexibility here for the, for the council to choose um, a path forward. Um, and I'll just say, you know, before I turn it over to council member Hudis, um, uh, you know, you're, you're asking me to choose, but I don't feel like there's enough information. I don't feel like, um, you know, Mr. Foley's had an opportunity to talk it through enough. Um, you know, I, I you know, I, what I hear are lots of worries and no, no um, talking through to see which, which of the worries are, are big and which are small kind of thing. I, I don't feel like I can choose. I mean, I, I, I clearly traffic is an issue, but will it be an issue with, with this use? I, I you know, can't tell hours of operation, you know, I think they need to, to figure that out. So I'm, I'm not very ready to make, to choose what parameters would work at this point. Um, so I'll turn it over to Mr. He Mr. Council Member Hudis. Council Member Hudis. Yeah, no, I just had a question about um, a little bit about how we got here is it is it really true that the residents didn't know that a restaurant could be used there? Is that is is that um, it seems as though we you know we've got some time pressures on this thing, but is is that is that the case? This property has been zoned for commercial uses since thirty or forty years ago, so it's always been capable of using a a restaurant use. So the fact that it was in the, the it's, in our general, it's in our general plan and zoning. So right. it's always been zoned for the, in, in these uses. We didn't change. As you remember, Tate, we had to go through it to make that a commercial. This has always been able to be used as a commercial use. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments, ultimately a motion?
Vice Mayor Rennie? Um, I, again, I'm not sure of the right answer, but I'll just talk a little more and hopefully <laughs> others will join in. You know, I guess the, you know, one issue is, you know, what they want to try is during the summer. And so I was trying to trying to figure out how do we move forward, but, you know, in, in figuring it out, if we wait for another council member to approve a council meeting to approve it, then you know, most of the summer's gone because we're not gonna have another council meeting for five weeks at least, I think. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out how to stumble through this. I'm not sure I wanna just say no, um, but I'm not sure what yes is either <laughs> or maybe or how do we move forward so i'm looking looking to see if others have ideas council member hudas um i have an opinion that i i don't think it's enough time uh to uh un until further discussions go on um between mr foley and and the residents there and and come to you know either a, something acceptable that that they're both willing to try because um, I don't I don't feel like it's tangible enough to say yes do it and we'll evaluate in early August because I don't know what we're uh, really approving at this point so I, I my opinion is I would prefer to see this a little bit further along I understand the summers taking away, but um, I would imagine this concept would probably be valid uh, until the weather, you know, gets really bad. Councilmember Badami? Uh, as Ms. Quintana said and, and others, I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea, but then you have to look at the location and the logistics of it, and, and I can't think of any restaurant that's located at a dead end street anywhere. I mean, you've got to have circulation, but then you have to look at, okay, is the need for the, um, or the purpose mostly to satisfy the foot traffic and the cyclists that might come through, but that's going to be not something that's all year long. It's usually weather permitting that would be during the summer. And more than anything, it would be on weekends because that's when you get the traffic to, to uh, enjoy the outdoors. They might draw them there to that location. So, and then I have to struggle with the fact that yes, Mr. Foley is willing to work with the HOA and I have no doubt that he will. Um, however, I'm not sure that it can be reciprocated to a, a level that would be comfortable for both. So I'm not sure were there. I'm not even sure how it would work, um, but those are my thoughts. Vice Mayor Remy. Um, thank you, Mayor. So continuing to try to see if there is a solution here. Um, this is really a question for staff. Um, would there be some way for the council to um, make a motion that says we would approve this um, with if staff was satisfied that there was an agreement between Mr. Foley and the Forbes Mill Association for some way to move forward without, you know, that staff could then ultimately say, yes, we've, we've come to an agreement and then it could get started instead of us having to wait six weeks or so. In, any suggestions from staff whether that could work or not? <laughs> Uh, that's certainly an option. Thank you for, for the thought. I think we would still probably want some kind of additional parameters. Um, and I think we've talked about a lot of different issues this evening. So if it's hours of operation, uh, parking, et cetera, you know, I think we would, it would be helpful to know what are the issues that we're trying to agree upon um, and then if there's a timeline, you know, what if we aren't able to come to an agreement, um, you know, by a certain time, would you want that to come back for consideration in August? Um, you know, and then, you know, staff would most likely have to be a party 
to those conversations. So that way we could um, understand what both sides are, are giving and taking um, and discussing. And so, you know, that, that's going to take a little bit of resource, but yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine. I think we would just want to know, you know, what's the goal, what, what would count, what would success look like uh, for a pop-up for the summer? And if we understood what the goal was in terms of what the council is looking for in terms of neighborhood compatibility, you know, hours of operation or, or that type of thing, I think it would, it just might be helpful uh, as opposed to it being everything on the table. Um, we could be negotiating all summer and, and not conclude. And so mayor, let me add a few comments again, trying to figure out if, if something would work, you know, in my mind, I think you, you know, so in terms of parameters, probably finishing before sunset makes a lot of sense because we don't have lighting on Forbes mill bridge. Right. You know, and we're, we're thinking we want people to be walking here or biking here. Um, and then trying to leave in the dark doesn't make any, any sense. Um, there's some concern about music. You know, I know we give music by right, but we could say no music um, because we're the landlords, for example. Um, uh, other, uh, let's see, so other types of parameters. You know, I, it, it seems like it's only one day a week and, and it would be an interesting test to see what kinds of problems really do develop from it. I, oh, I was going to say the other, other parameter for sure is, I mean, the, what, what's written in the staff report is this is till October 30th, but it would have to be well understood that this is a test that's over October 30th. And there, you know, this is no promise that anything would, you know, continue after, or there's no promise that even if there isn't problems that um, a restaurant can go here afterwards, that's, you know, completely start over um, negotiation. Um, it looks like Mr. Schultz wants to add, add in some and I'll, I'll let him do that. Mr. Schultz, you're on mute. Certainly with any agreement that was reached, not only would we say that it, there's no vested interest past October 30th, but would it, it would give us the you know, you know, you know, the right to cancel also if in fact there are complaints. As the one who receives all the code enforcement complaints, I'll be the first to know I have the same concerns as you do. But what I do somewhat like about this is, you know, we approved HAPAs and we have had complaints and we did put conditions there, no outside music. We provided noise attenuations, but we still have gotten a few complaints about that. Um, and so one of the things you'll find is if just the noise of people talking outside here is something that we're not going to be able to control and that will give this lessee the ability to absolutely know from this point forward he's got to look for office space as opposed to if we don't go through this and he's still trying to find the correct mix of a restaurant, uh, you know, where are we at? So the idea of, you know, a Saturday uh, before it's dark um, with limited hours, limited parking, you know, you could put in that all employees cannot park um, and make them park in miles. You could require a parking attendant outside even to make certain that parking spots aren't used that are part of the Forbes mills. So there are ways to allow for four Saturdays in July and come back in the first meeting in August. Or as if, if you're not comfortable with that, uh, you, you certainly can wait till August and, and, and see if they, let's see, still wants to try to pursue it in August. But I think there's many ways we can combat it. And like I said, I, I'm concerned and, and uh, I'll be the first one that gets the call or the email if there are complaints from the, from the forms mills people that we'll have to deal with to try to figure out mitigation measures, but it's always nice. I wish I could, for every project, have it a, a pilot project to see if it's going to fit in with the neighborhood and be compatible with the surroundings. 
in this case, we've got the ability to try that. But if that's not what council wants, then then I think the message will be, if a pilot program doesn't work, then the message to this from this lessee is is to not look for a restaurant whatsoever and to concentrate on office. Because I don't think I don't I don't think retail. I think uh, Mr. Foley would tell you that there's no way a retail is going to work down in this location. Council Member Hughes. Um, yeah, I mean, I would um, sort of respectfully disagree a little bit that a permanent um, high-end restaurant is totally different than this. It it it, it really. Uh, the, the way people learn about it, the way they go there, um, and the fact that the cooking is indoors, uh, there could be sound insulation indoors. I mean, I do think that, I'm, I, do, I don't think we're gonna learn a great deal about a, a, a long-term restaurant from this experiment. Um, I think we'll learn about the way that the, uh, you know, the, that uh, Mr. Foley and the other operators uh, cooperate with Forbes Mill, I think that might, we might learn a bit about that. Um, but I had a specific question and that is, could we also require um, a parking agreement between the restaurant and the For Forbes Mill for additional spaces um, as, as uh, one of the parameters? If in fact, there, you know, it seemed to be there is some excess parking there. The council can put whatever parameters they want on, on, on this project. Council member Hughes, do you have a second question? No, that was it. Okay. Council member Padami. We were to put that kind of parameter on there I don't think that the from you know the material I've read, the speakers you know that we've heard, that the HOA would be willing to do that. And what I'm going to be looking for is that um, Mr. Foley work with the concerns and satisfaction of the HOA um, before moving forward uh, with this. So that might even be a moot point. Uh, what Mr. Hughes is bringing. I'm sorry, council member Hughes. <laughs> All due respect. Any other thoughts? I'll go ahead and share mine. Um, I think it was Vice Mayor Rennie that says, I'm trying to figure out how to frame it so that I can say yes. Um, I like, um, it's easier for me to say what I don't like. Um, Actually, let's start with what I do like, what I've heard so far. Having people vacate by sunset, I, I would be in agreement with that. I think um, having a parking attendant so that we can monitor the parking and, um, and actually receive data on whether or not traction of attracting people to a place that can't be seen off the main street. I think that would be an interesting um, to see how many people actually find it and walk down there uh, without taking parking. Trash, I think is a big concern that I've heard. Um, monitoring trash in, trash out, uh, the trash out and, and making sure that there are no complaints. I think noise is gonna be a valid one. Um, I'm, I would be supportive of the idea of tightening those parameters, giving them a month, and then coming back at the very first meeting to see how it goes. I just don't know if that would be an investment that Mr. Foley would be willing to make for a month. Huh? And so that those are, those are so many unknowns that, that, still, um, that are still out there. Vice Mayor Rennie. Maybe this is a question for Mrs. Wren. Um, I get the feeling this isn't that big of an, an investment because um, Oak and Rye already has the trailer, they said. So they're basically pulling up their trailer and they're coming up with some tables. Maybe they have to buy or maybe they already have. Um, so it might not be that 
big of an investment for them to try it. You know, in other words, we're saying, yeah, go ahead for a month. And then two months in, we say, well, it's not working. Um, I'm, I'm unsure that it's really going to be that big a deal for them. And maybe Ms. Wren has an idea on that. I think there's um, a couple of different investment pieces here. First would be the cleanup of the outdoor area and then the furniture, as you stated, tables or whatever comes in. Um, and then second to that, that as a small business in Los Gatos, they're already needing to staff their brick and mortar restaurant. So I think the investment for them will be finding the staff that can maintain this, you know, this pop-up. I don't, I don't foresee, you know, one set of staff being there 12 hours. That doesn't probably make sense in the restaurant world. So, you know, they're going to be looking at strategically planning. And I don't want to speak for them and their business model, but just from my limited knowledge of how it all works, I think that's really going to be the investment from Oak and Ryan being able to, to plan long-term of, you know, are we hiring these extra staff for a month? You know, is it a three month commitment? I don't, I don't know. And that's a conversation that I think, um, you know, Mr. Foley could have with them, as you're saying, when he talks about the feasibility of it. So there's definitely the investment on the restaurant side and the investment on the Forbes Mill LLC side. Vice Mayor, your hand is still up. Well, I'm maybe trying to think if I can make a motion. Uh, you know, what, what you said, Mayor, seemed pretty good. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to exactly say the motion that um, we ask um, staff to come up with, um, to, to work with Mr. Foley, working with um, the Forbes Mill Association to work work these details out, but with the parameters that um, employees can't park there, they've got to park um, somewhere else. Miles would be nice, or in one of the other lots. Um, that it's got to close by sunset. Um, noise um, needs to be controlled. Um, you know, no no music. Um, uh, the parking attendant idea seems to be popular that might cost them too much, but, you know, let's put it in and anyway. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 you know, the trash needs to be monitored. I, we'll, we'll see what happens with trash. I, I suspect they're going to clean it up anyway, but we'll, we'll put it on the list. Um, and then, you know, also put in the, provision that if it really doesn't seem like it's working two months in that we might cancel it. So I would, I would make a motion if staff thinks that's an adequate motion that they can impl implement. <laughs> and Ms. Wren? Thank you. And Ms. Prevetti may have the clarification on this, but are you, are those parameters that you just set for, forth, are you saying that you would approve it with those parameters or you're still looking for the communication and the agreement of both parties with those parameters. I'm just trying to understand where. Um, uh, I, I would, I think all of us would like to see Mr. Foley work more with, I, I don't think he's had a chance really to work much with the Forbes Mill. So we'd like him to work with them. Um, and we would like staff to kind of oversee the process to the point they feel like they're, they're close to agreement. And then I've provided our parameters at which they need to help create an agreement. I think, is this making any sense? <laughs> yes, and, and so long it, it would include additional parameters that staff feels is necessary in order uh, to make the business successful along with the, with the uh, compatibility with the neighborhood. Because there's other issues we haven't even mentioned that we can re require signage um, if additional signage is necessary regarding parking, there could be additional signage regarding respecting the neighborhood and keeping it quiet. There's other things that I think we can do to help with mitigate the issues that have been raised. And, and so I would make part of my motion would be that we aren't going to prevent you from adding any parameters that, that look like it'll make the agreement go. Council member Padami. I have a question for the maker of the motion. So is this conditioned that before they can move forward experimenting on a Saturday, that all the details are worked out between the HOA, 
Mr. Foley and staff to the satisfaction of all parties before we start a first Saturday? Um, I would not word it that way because I don't think you're going to get complete satisfaction from all parties. Um, that, that would be a little bit strong. I'm leaving it up to staff to decide that they're close enough and, and something has been worked out. Um, I've been around long enough to know that, you know, whatever agreement we work out, there's some one person somewhere that doesn't like it. <laughs> um, and so the idea is to get, I think, get close. Um, is, 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 did I make this muddier for staff? Uh, let me just clarify then, um, would staff be the one to determine that it's quote, good enough? Yes. Okay. That was, that was my original um, motion. That was originally what I was trying to say to the satisfaction of staff. And they've been around longer than I have even <laughs> to, to know when we're, when we're close. Okay. And so if I may, Mayor, you know, we would certainly give it our best shot working with all interested parties. Um, I don't know if we're going to find that sweet spot where everybody's happy or where we're close enough, but we're willing to give it a try. And if worse comes to worse, you don't get there before the next council meeting and you have to bring it back to us. So we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I'll actually second it. Any comments to the motion and or further questions? Okay, so I'll call the question. Council Member Badami. I'm gonna vote no because I'm just not comfortable going forward. Uh, without further details being worked out, leaving it up to staff, it just doesn't seem fair. Council Member Hudis. Um, I'm gonna vote no as well. I, um, I, I'm sympathetic to everything about this project. I just don't think we're quite there yet um, in terms of council being able to say yes or no. And Vice Mayor Rennie. Sort of doesn't matter at this point <laughs> how I vote, does it? Special because um, just because you make the motion and second it doesn't mean that you're voting. I'll vote yes. And I'll vote yes. And so we are at a 2-2 two -two tie. So the motion does not pass and there is no action. At the... Would anyone else like to try a motion? or give further direction to staff. Uh, a question? Yes, uh, uh, what, what would be the soonest that we could hear this again if they did make progress? We um, are, I believe our first meeting in August, I'll have to look at the calendar unless Ms. Provetti, you have it in front of you. August 3rd. I believe it's August 3rd. So that's early in August. And I would certainly think that maybe we could go beyond the October date that's been identified if, um, if we wanted to do that. So once, I, I think the October date is because of the daylight savings. And so once you're done with daylight savings, because of the lighting issues and the Im public improvements that would need to be done, I think that's the reason why that date is set. Not so much from a weather standpoint. It wouldn't take a motion in order to, to hear this again, correct? Correct. Um, I'd ask for a motion to continue it. Hmm. I would move to continue to uh, date certain of um, August 3rd. And, and Councilmember Badami? A second. Okay. 
And um, as just a question, what um, what would you like to see come back on August 3rd? Um, I would like to see some of the details that Mr. Foley said were unresolved to be um, better articulated, such as hours of operation um, that uh, and uh, parking um, and uh, to have uh, a better sense from the uh, neighbors about whether that would be acceptable to them. And the maker of the motion? I mean, I'm sorry, the seconder of the motion, is that your understanding? You accept That's my it? Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, any questions or comments to the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Council Member Badami? Aye. Council Member Hudis? Aye. Vice Mayor Redding? Aye. I also vote aye, and the matter is continued until August 3. And we look forward to that discussion. That um, concludes all of our business for tonight. Um, because I did close our uh, verbal communications at the 30 minute mark, I will open it again so that those speakers that did not have a chance to speak on verbal communications will have their opportunity now. Again, it's three minutes to those who would like to speak. I see no hands raised. And so council members, I, I will adjourn the meeting. I hope all of you have a restful July. Um, and to actually, I see one hand raised. So I'm gonna go back um, so that we accommodate all speakers. Carrie, and if anyone else would like to speak, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm just gonna open it for Carrie and that's it. Hi there, long night. Just really quick, um, I didn't get to hear all the speakers ahead of me, and I know some people were complaining about them. I did hear other people complaining about them too. Um, but what I wanted to say is I've lived here for 25 years. I don't remember ever being or feeling like this town was racist. And all of a sudden in the last year, it feels like racism is everywhere. It just popped up and it's very disconcerting. I remember walking into a building and looking at the store sign and not at the door, it said, everyone is welcome. It never occurred to me that they wouldn't be. So I kind of feel like we keep looking for racism. We keep looking for these things and we're gonna find it. We all have different definitions. I mean, we, we're using the same words, but everybody has some different meaning behind it or understanding. And I've learned this past year because I'm white, I'm racist. Because I'm a Republican, I'm a whatever phobe you wanna attach to me automatically. I mean, it's gotten pretty ugly. And there seems to be all this justification for mistreating people like myself because the means or the, you know, the, the yeah, the means, the ends justify the means. It's late as we all know. So it's, it's frustrating to listen to these conversations going back and forth and people accusing people of not being educated. They are educated and they're frustrated and they feel attacked like I feel attacked and I don't feel safe in my own town. And I've been here 25 years. Is anybody gonna look out for me? Does anybody care how I feel? It doesn't seem that way. So anyway, that's uh, kind of what I wanted to say. And, and I wanted to say that also the people who are saying people aren't educated, maybe they should be reading stuff like Color Communism and Common Sense by Manning Johnson or authors like Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, Malcolm X before stating people who don't agree with them don't know what they're talking about. Thank you and have a good night and get some rest. Good night. And so council members, I adjourn tonight's meeting and have a good night, everyone. <laughs>